Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Digital Today's podcast. I am Dave. I'm Ron. And Ron, we have episode 233 today, and we are yes. officially kicking off year six. Six of Digital to Dice. You know, it's too bad that 233 isn't a multiple of six or three. Well, the two threes are six, I guess. No. In order to be a multiple of three, it needs to end in a three, six, or a nine. Oh, and so that's why, that's, and see, three. that's why you are here, is you, you bring up this stuff that educates us so, all. So, yes. So, I finally found my purpose after five years and change. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, hey, ways to get a hold of us, digitaltodice.com, digitaltodice.com is the website. 978-751-DICE is the text line. Send us a text. Digitaltodice at yahoo.com is the email. And over on Facebook, join the Facebook group and chat with us, facebook.com slash groups slash digitaltodice. Now, Ron, we do have a very special guest here that's going to help us kick off year six of the show. It's a very nice guest, too. It is. And we're really excited to have him on. And none other than Keith Avalon from Play Games. Keith, thanks for coming on the show. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being on with us. This what is- can we talk about? <laughs> Tons to talk about. Oh, let me see here. Yeah, what can we talk about here? Oh, well, I, let's talk about games, shall we? Let's talk about let's games. Do that. <laughs> That's good because, you know, my, my Chinese cooking skills, you know, aren't that great anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I get up this morning and I had all this stir fry around my bedroom. I guess I, really? I must have been walking in my sleep. Oh, uh, I saw what you did there. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I had to do it. I had to do it. Where's, where's my thing? There we go. There's the drums. Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Becky will not be cleaning up your room after. <laughs> all right. Anyway, hey, before we get going, Keith, we do have one question that we like to ask all our guests to come on the show. All right. And that question is, if you could go back in time and attend any sporting event at all, what would that event be? Uh, I would probably be, I would go back to Tulane Stadium in November of 1970 and watch Tom oh. Dempsey kick the 63-yard field goal. That was awesome one. I, I've watched that clip thousands of times. It never ceases to amaze. It's 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 such a great such a great moment. I mean when he hits the ball, it's like boom, a cannon going off. And there's Don Cricky saying, I don't believe it. You know, because he's talking he's talking about it like yeah. what what are you doing here? This is just, you know, this what a joke. You know, so Six, they're actually going to try a 63 yard field goal. And then when he hits it, it's like an unbelievable moment. So, it, so what makes you say that? Cause that's, we talked a little bit before you came on. You're not from Detroit or new Orleans. You're out in Colorado. You grew up on the East coast. So I mean, did nothing wrong with that, but. Well, I am a, a big saints fan. Oh, uh, are you? Okay. And there's a, there's a story behind that. We moved to, we moved around a lot when I was a kid, um, a lot of people think my dad was in the military. Actually, he was uh, he was uh, in the process of changing careers. He's actually a musician. He was a professional musician at first. He played with Buddy Rich and Johnny Mathis. Oh wow! Then he, then he got out of that because uh, after he got married, because he didn't want to be working until four a.m. Then he started teaching school, uh, teaching music, and then he my my brother was diagnosed. This is a long story here. Uh, I'll try to keep it concise. My brother was diagnosed with asthma, and in those days, this, the the cure for that was to go move to a dry climate. So we had to find we had to move to Arizona. We moved to Arizona. There was a a a, a, a basically a school for delinquent boys, basically a minimum security prison for kids that were not old enough to go to prison. It was out in the middle of the desert in Arizona, a place called Fort Grant, the Arizona State Industrial School. And they hired my dad to teach the band there. And in doing so, he got really interested in career in counseling. He was okay. really kind of kind of a teacher, part teacher, part, part counselor. And then he made the switch to, he made the switch from music to counseling. He got his degree in psychology and he finished his career as a, uh, as a career counselor at the University of Texas at San Antonio. So oh, nice. in the process of this, of this career change, and we kind of get followed along all over the country. We went from, from Connecticut to Arizona to Wisconsin and uh, then to Texas and, uh, so when we moved to Wisconsin, this was this was 1967. Uh, I didn't know anything about football, but of course it was, it was Packers country. Everybody, everybody, all everybody in my class, sixth grade class, everybody loved football. Everybody loved the Packers, and I knew that if I wanted to fit in, I needed to follow football, right? So, but but being like being myself, it's like I didn't want to be like everybody else. 
and follow the Packers. I needed to follow a different team. What, what team should I follow? And so I'm thinking, well, well, what team should I follow? And I was looking through the newspaper, and there was this picture of, uh, of this guy with a, wearing a helmet with a fleur de on it. I thought, oh, that's cool. What team is that? It's the Boy Scout symbol, right? That's so right. And I'm reading it's Dave Witzel from the New Orleans Saints. I'm going to say, that's my team. So that was my team from then on. And uh, little did I know how much pain it was going to bring me uh, over the years, although they they got they got better once Jim Mora arrived, but that wasn't until 1986. So it was basically 20 years of, of misery. The paper anyway, bags were so, great. I love the paper bags on the fans. Yes, yes. So – with all with that in, as the context, that moment in 1970 was like unbelievable. You know, for a Saints fan, for a, for a, for a you know a 13 year old Saints fan, it was uh, incredibly meaningful. So and, I, I remember I, I raced home to uh, we had band practice. I like, played the city band on Monday when they practiced on Monday nights. But I always wanted to catch the, the halftime highlights mm-hmm. with Howard Cosell because that was the only way you could see highlights. In those right. days, you know, so I run on, I, I, I definitely made a mad dash that day. So I could actually, cause I, I, I hadn't seen it. I, I just heard about it, you know? So I, I made it home, uh, in time for the halftime highlights and, and, uh, got to see him kick it, you know, and it was, it was a great moment. I think so, he actually teed it up from his own 37, right? Yeah. Right. Was, yes, he did. On yes, the goal he did. Line. Yeah. It was an eight yard, again, an extra yard, extra yard, just so he'd be able to clear the, you know, clear the, uh, the the line. So, and and the Lions barely rushed it. You could see in the replay, it's kind of like, eh, you know, he's never going to make this. Yeah. But man, when he hit that ball with his foot, boom! It didn't clear that bar by much. I mean, no, it wouldn't no, have been good from sixty three and a half. <laughs> you know? No, no, didn't need it to be though. Yeah. Right. So you know, if your dad was in a, played with Johnny Mathis, chances are, chances oh, here are we go. It was awful good. And chances yeah. are awful good. Yes, right. Um. When the Baltimore kicker hit the 65 yarder a couple of years ago, that was also against the Lions. So both, yes, so both the record sets were against the Lions, and they were both at sea level because the Baltimore kick was in Detroit, was at Ford Field. Right. So it wasn't like when Elam hit the 63 yarder a few years ago in Denver. You know, that was at altitude. You know, yeah, Elam's, yeah. kick, Elam's kick wasn't a game winner. It was just, I think it was at halftime. Halftime. So, yeah, so both of those kicks that were against Detroit, and they both were game-winning kicks. And, and both both on relatively, you know, low-altitude kicks, yeah. too. Yeah. Do you so. think we'll see a kick longer than 65? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I just finished rating the, uh, you know, the NFL season for second season. And, you know, so I, I get a look, uh, an up-close look, deep dive into the stats every year when I prepare that release and, uh, I mean, it's getting to the point now where kickers just – they just don't miss from any distance, really. It's, that's the thing that I really noticed this year was, uh, you know, in, in years past, it was kind of like a, kind of like a, a distribution bell cur- curve. So as you got further out, you know, the, the, the percentage would go down. So you're more likely to hit a, like a 40-yarder, more likely to hit a 30-yarder than a 40-yarder, more likely to hit a 40-yarder than a 50-yarder. But really now, I mean, honestly – it, it it's it's on you it, they, they basically the same percentage from any distance even extra points you know they you know it's like 95 percent from whether you're kicking an extra point or whether you're kicking it from 50 something yards it's it's i mean that's overstating it but but it's it's getting more and more true it's more and more like that and i i, I do see a day where i mean i think there's a physical limit as to how far you can kick a football but i don't think we've reached it i bet i bet someday somebody will kick a 70 yard field goal Boy, that'd be a long one, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. It, speaking about field goals and, and accuracy and things, you know, we play a lot of games here in, in the community. And uh, I was playing a game the other day, and I was trying to kick a thirty or thirty-one yard field goal, and I had less than a fifty percent chance of hitting it with my kicker because I was right. I was playing seventies football, and yes. it's like I can't believe that I have the ball on the fourteen yard line. And I'm setting up to kick a 30, 31 yard field goal, and it's it's like fifty percent or fifty point six percent of chance of hitting this field goal from, from thirty. That's nuts. Yeah, I, I I always just think of that. I think it's I, I want to say it was it was Bob Timberlake of the nineteen sixty six Giants. I think it was where he hit like one out of seventeen field goal attempts. Oh. Might have been one out of twelve. It was like he hit like one out of seventeen. It's like. After you miss the sixth or seventh, why are you still kicking it? You know, how do they even let him try that many field goals? Right. 
Well, and, the the you know, upside is if you missed, you got the ball at the 20. So if you were right. picking a 35, 40, or 50 yarder, it was, you know, just the same as a punt. But it does it does make you wonder, though, and, and that's a great point, Ron. It always makes you wonder, why didn't they try more field goals then? Because, you know, you'll see, like, it, it, you look at the 69 season or the 70 season, you know, the, the, the kicker, leading kicker will have, yeah, 25, mm. maybe 30 field goals, top, attempts, tops. But it's like, yeah, why wouldn't you just try it all the time? I think you would. They said you had the the ball had to land inside the twenty for it to be uh, brought to the twenty. So in other words, if you tried an eighty yard field goal and you only kicked it to midfield, that's where the ball would go. Right. Yeah, so. but, but the punting averages in those days were like the, the the typical punter averaged like thirty five, thirty eight yards a kick. Well, they were using early. the same. They were using the same football. Today, you know, there's a special kickers football. Right. What I'm saying is, you could clearly kick the ball further from a tee than you could from, for, you know, for, as the punter. So why not just try the field goal? You'll kick it further. Yeah. And you know, it, I just I don't know why they didn't think of that. What's the college record? Because they they can use a tee in college, and they can't in in the pros. Was it sixty six or sixty seven? I, I think it was. I know Russell Erksleben. Right. Way back, kicked a 66 yarder in college. And, and that's why he was drafted in the first round by your Saints. That's right. And he was another great pick, wasn't he? Wasn't that a great pick? <laughs> Boy, we haven't had this much New York Saints football talk on the channel in quite oh. some time. <laughs> yes. So, so, Keith, what got you into gaming? I always played games. Uh, you know, we I grew up in a real small town in Wisconsin. We I was born in Connecticut. We moved to Arizona. Moved to Wisconsin at the age of ten, and uh, uh, you know, it was a small town, six thousand people, and there wasn't a lot going on. We didn't have a lot of money. We we're pretty poor, you know. So, board games, games, you know, were we, we played a lot of cards. We played a lot of board games, and uh, that's what got me into games. It was a, mm-hmm. it was a way of, of, enter, of you know entertainment, form of entertainment. We didn't. Mm-hmm. We only had uh, you know like a couple of TV stations. They didn't come in that that well. Uh, so yeah, we didn't have a lot of entertainment options. We played a lot of games. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and that plus the fact that I enjoy playing games. So we play more games. Uh, and, uh, that's what kind of got me into it. And it wasn't okay. too long before I was, you know, kind of designing my own games. Uh, or it, it was kind of almost like a group project. Our, our neighborhood kids, we just, we would play these games and we would, like one of the things we get, we made a, an expanded version of Monopoly. We, we made our own board. We added properties. We had a set of properties to each side. So it was like a, a super big monopoly. And we, we got the, the thrill of naming the, the streets and the hotel. Oh, that's cool. So, and, and that's the kind of thing we would do. Um, we would we'd make games like that and, and play them. Uh, so that's kind of how I got in, into playing games. And it's just, uh, you know, just a matter of doing something you enjoy and, and discovering that you enjoy it and then doing it more. So uh, what about sports gaming? So, uh, as I mentioned, when we moved to Wisconsin, that's when I, you know, kind of by default, I realized I needed to follow football. And then again, once I started following, it's like, oh, this is pretty cool. This is I really, I really enjoyed it. The thing about football that I really enjoyed was the was the color, the uniforms, and the helmets, yeah. and the pageantry of it, and uh, uh, that was very, very appealing to me. And so, um, I, I really became a, 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 a pretty strong football fan, and. I, I, I wanted to get the, the, the greatest Christmas gift I ever got. Uh, you know, you, you see Ralphie in the, in the BB gun. I, I had a similar experience, but for me, it was an electric football game. I wanted an electric football oh. game. And uh, my, my mom and dad were very cagey about it, saying, no, I don't think, I don't think we're going to be able to get that for you. And then lo and behold, there it was under the tree that Christmas morning. And it was, it was the most thrilling thing for me. Uh, and so that was how I you know, we started playing a football game. It was right. electric football. And we played that a lot. Uh, me and my best friend, Don, who lived on a dairy farm outside Sparta, um, he uh, he and I, we were both broke. We had, we had no money. But I, I used to be able to make, like, a little money ironing clothes and doing some right. – I'd get a little birthday money every now and, get, and now and again. Uh, we, we teamed up, you know – we, we we played a lot of electric football. He got an electric football game. I got an electric football game. We started, we started sending away. Did you ever figure out how to pass? Uh, yeah, with a little guy going, 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, did, we did that. And the kicker, you could kick the field goals too. Yeah. Uh, so we we would send away to Two Door for the blank teams. Well, first of all, we we sent away for teams because you could order them from Two Door. You know that you could order right. them. the game. My game came with the Colts and the Packers. So of course I sent away immediately and got the Saints. And uh, I was a little disappointed because they I don't know where they had them done, but they were very quickly painted and you know they're kind of they didn't the little the little flirtily on the helmet didn't look. It was still like an X. It didn't look like a flirt of And so I was kind of disappointed. And we sent away for a couple of other teams like that, and they were similarly quickly painted. They didn't seem to have much quality control. So we, we decided, let's just buy the blank teams. We'll paint them ourselves. So eventually, we had all 26 NFL teams between the two of us. And we would play out like a whole schedule. Uh, you know, like we, we'd have our schedule and we'd play. I would play the, the you know, the, the Colts and the Browns, and I would play the Saints and the in, in the Rams or whatever, and he would play his part of the games. After a while, we, we got to this. We, at that point, we were like 13, 12, 13, 14 years old. And, uh, you know, electric football was fun, but it was, it left a lot to be desired in terms of realism. You know, it, you know, it, 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 there wasn't any, all the teams were the same. We kind of got the idea that, uh, you know, we'd like to have a game that, that sort of captured real football. And so, you know, like a lot of kids from our era, we would buy the, you know, we would go to the drugstore and get the, the football magazines. And you'd see the ads in the back. And it basically for us, it came down to APA or Stratomatic. And we sent away to both APA and Stratomatic for the, for the, uh, the literature, you know, and we waited with bated breath until they both arrived. And they both arrived uh, within a couple days of each other. We got together and we studied those pamphlets and the literature just – you know, religiously, and and we ultimately it was very close. We didn't really, you know, we liked both the games. They both looked really super exciting, uh, but we can only afford one. In fact, we had to team up our funds in order to be able to buy one. We right. neither of us had enough money to buy one, so we we t- we decided to team up our our uh, our funds and buy one, and we opted for Appa. So we bought the Appa game and we played that game. I'm not exaggerating to say we played literally thousands of Apple football games. Greg, Greg Barris said that you were a huge Apple guy. Oh, Apple my gosh. Guy. We played. We would go out to my friends. So my, so my friend lived on a dairy farm uh, about six miles from my house. We would ride our bikes out to his house uh, in the afternoon. Uh, like there, there's like we had this league of like eight guys. There's like eight of us. We would, and, and his mom and dad lived in one house. His grandfather lived in another house so we were on the same property. Uh, and so uh, we we would go to, we would go over to Don's house. We'd ride our bikes over there in the afternoon. We'd help with the chores. We would put pizza in the oven. Those little Geno's frozen pizzas. Okay. We'd have a draft. We would draft our apple. We would draft all, all eight teams. We would play an entire season that night. We'd play the entire season. We'd stay up to like five in the morning playing the entire 10 game season. And then we'd have another draft and then we'd help with the chores. And then we'd go home and just <sighs> that. So I'm not, I'm not exaggerating to say we played literally thousands of Apple football games. Uh, we played, we, we played 26 seasons of our, our Apple football league. And we played 26 seasons in the span of about, I don't know, maybe six, five or six years, you know, so still have the, keep stats still have them. I do. I do have them. I should actually run at the garage and show. I've got the, the bound, the binders. We would do it on, on uh, carbon paper. You know, oh my we word. Type, we would type it out so that we could each have copies, you know, <laughs> and so Don would type it out and then we'd each get a copy of the stats. Yeah, I know. And it's, it's craziness, isn't it? I couldn't, we, we cleaned out the crawl space a couple of years ago and I had it on the trash pile. Cause I thought I'm never, I'm never going to use, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to look at these again. I'm just going to throw it away. Couldn't bring myself to throw it away. You shouldn't. No, you should actually scan them and put them on the yeah. play site. Yeah. In oh. all seriousness, people would, people would look at that stuff. Are you, you know how long it takes me to scan it? I'm talking about, there's probably, I don't know, I don't know how many pages. It, it would be, it's, it's probably four or five massive notebooks of stats, like, written stats. That's still incredible. Yeah. Yeah, well. It was it was a labor of love. We loved it. We loved it. Of course, and, and the thing was, you know, we never, you know, in thinking about it now, it's, it's odd because we never wanted to play. We f- we felt like if we used the the the, the stars of the of the NFL, that right. our, our games would be too good. 
You know, we, we didn't want to just, we'd have a, like an Australia. We didn't want an Australia league. So we always drafted from the extra players. So the stars of our league were guys like Ed Hargett and uh, King Hill and uh, John Stofa and uh, uh, household names, not even in their own house. Yeah, Glenn, Glenn Turner, uh, Mac Hill, guys like Tom Smiley, guys like that. Those are our major stars. And uh, so you know, it must have been so thrilling when when they would go through and play in Green Bay and and you'd see them on. TV on Sundays or on the, on Monday night if if you got ABC to see yeah. those you know like oh yeah here is, you know oh, I'm not here to see Roger Staubach and Tony Hill oh, I, I got Preston Pearson this week you know yeah, right right so what so you talked a little bit about expanding games such as Monopoly and some of the war games and you played you know somewhere short of twenty thousand APA football games what what caused you or what was your creative impetus to create your own games the sports games well we played apple football and uh, there were things about it that we didn't like um particularly like one of the things that i didn't like about it was the fact that uh if if you had bobby douglas who got sacked you know if, if you had the 1969 card of bobby douglas who got sacked like 80 times uh but he's a pretty good runner you could build a great offensive line, but he'd still get sacked 80 times because all the sack numbers were on his column, right. on the P column. Uh, so, you know, stuff like that, you know, we want, we wanted tinkering. Of course, when we started, when we first started with that, but there was no medium pass. It was a short pass and a long pass. And we thought we need to have a medium pass. We made our own medium pass. So after a while, it was like, well, you know, we made so many changes. Let's just make our own game, you know, or that's the way I felt about it. So I'm going to make right. my own game. So that's when I started messing around with making my own football game. And that was that was sort of the impetus for it. So second season, your first game? Second season was my first game, although it had many different forms uh, in the 70s. It really kind of the, – the, the form that it's in right now really came along in the 80s, the early 80s. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, it's essentially unchanged since then. But, yeah, it was, there was a, a, about a five-year period – uh, between like 1978 and 1982, where the game was in several different kind of forms, okay, uh, and it sort of moved toward the toward the second season model by the by the, the early to mid 80s. But that was my first attempt at a sports game. Okay. Now, did, did you in that time? You're talking like the you know, late 70s, early 80s. That's when the whole video game craze start, started. It, it, that's the direction I went. And, and I, I kind of miss all these stories of people playing APRA in the 70s and 80s and growing up. Because I love playing all these games now on, on the tabletop now that I'm older. But I went the, the video game, you know, the Atari, the Nintendo, the Sega, right. and all that stuff there. And it's only when I get into my 50s when I had a hard time with controllers and the snap that I come over to um, cards and dice and tabletop sports. Uh, is, that, is that something that you that just didn't appeal to you, or did you get into the video games at that time? You know, I've never really gotten into computer games or video games. I mean, those are two really kind of different genres. The computer games, which generally you know will generate the stats and keep the stats for you, and I've never you know I've never really that's just not not grabbed me. Now, my, of course, I've got kids, uh, and when they were younger, they were very much into video games. Sam particularly likes video games, so. We did get. I mean, we played. We had, we had a GameCube, and we uh, we played a lot of Mario Party and all the different you know all the different uh, uh, GameCube games. Uh, and and I did get a copy of Tiger Woods Golf, and I got a copy of Madden, and we play. And I got a copy of the NHL. I think it's two K three. So I did. I did try them and play them, but I didn't. And and I won't. I wouldn't say I didn't enjoy them, but it never really grabbed me. Uh, I didn't like the fact that um, essentially, the, the, really, those are games first. They're first games. Yeah. They're not really Sims. They, you know, you could take it. It. it, 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 it bo- I wouldn't say it bothered me, but but it, it wasn't lost on me that if you're playing Madden and you've got the worst team in the NFL. And uh, I'm playing somebody, uh, playing against the best team in the NFL, but that person doesn't know how to play Madden. I'm going to win. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, you know, was like, well, it made it less fun. So I never really, I, I never really, you know, found the appeal. Yeah, I, of, I just picked up, um, I just picked up the uh, EA, EA's PGA Tour on the Steam sale. Picked it up for 11 bucks, $85 game. 
and the three nice. clicks. Yeah, oh, it's, it's great. It really is. Comes with thirty nine courses and all that. Yeah, and I, I just, um, you know, in trying to qualify for the PGA Tour, I tore apart a course in, in, in Calgary and shot forty one under for four. Nice. <laughs> you know, that first of all, that's fantastic. You know, fifty nine, sixty three, fifty nine, fifty nine. Yeah, but that's there's that's not mm. even close to anywhere realistic. So yeah. you know, to, to drive home your point is like it's fun, but it's not. It's not realistic. Well, that points to really what, uh, one of the the key things I think about this whole hobby is that you know what is fun, and and those games are designed to. I, I, I guarantee you, there are people who who would have done what you did, Ron, and thought that was incredibly fun. Super yeah. fun, and they couldn't wait to play it again because it's just the way that's just the way they you know they're built, they're they're wired, and then there are people who are wired differently where realism is important, and right, you know, so it's different strokes for different folks. So sure, mm-hmm. uh, all that to say, you know, uh, you know, video games are cool, but it's not the kind of thing that I really want to spend a lot of my time doing. Hmm. Yeah, that well, that's the route that I went, and I I missed out on all the fun. You know that that uh, that I have. You're up later. Yeah, I, I am. And my thing was is I remember getting a copy of Madden. I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, and a, they had a little tutorial to help you play the game. And I was like, okay, spin and get into the end zone, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't get the guy to spin and score a touchdown. I failed huh. at, uh, the whole tutorial. And then I got NBA 2K. And I'm a casual basketball guy, but I like to shoot and pass and play some basketball. And it, there was 13 different ways to take a shot. You know, push here, push here, hit that, click that, and he'll do a fadeaway. Now, if you go this way and this way and this way and this way, he'll do it. And, and I'm looking down at yeah. my hands, and they're taking the ball away from me. And, this, and I, I go, I, I, this is not meant for me anymore. And I did it's a video a game. game. Yeah, yeah, I did a video game podcast for about 10 years, and my co-host, who's my age, and, and she laughed at me. She says, she goes, Dave, you're not the target demographic anymore. You know, you're in your 50s. <laughs> and I says, you know, you're exactly right. And they just kept making the games more complex and more complex and more complex. I'm like, why? And they're like, because that's what the young kids want. They want that complexity. Yeah. And and um, you know now that it's instead of just a couple of buttons for Madden in the past, you're you're snapping it, you're looking, you're directing, you're passing, you're telling the guy what to do. It, it's there's like nine buttons you got to press to complete a pass. Sometimes I I can't do that, you know. So when I started playing these games here, whether it was you know Sims on the computer like Action PC and Strat PC football, I could just kick back, and I was amazed that I could just kind of in, enjoy the game without all the pressure. Of getting yeah. of dexterity, like you said, it's all about dexterity. The, the you know, if someone played me and I had the Pittsburgh Steelers champion Super Bowl and they had the seventy six Buccaneers, they would beat me because yeah. you know that's how bad I am. So when I, the sports Sims games, I was like, wow, I can actually enjoy these games. There's no pressure. Take my time and just you know call the plays or roll the dice or watch it on the screen, and it was. It was relaxing, which is what we need late in life with all the adulting going on, you know, coming down here and playing a game and not feeling any pressure and just having the game play out and then talking about it with your friends. It, there's something magical about that. Oh, absolutely. That I never got with video games. That command is Couldn't agree more. Right now. Well, someone said a magic word. I didn't hear it. What was it? Uh, I don't know, but my madam speaker decided that she needed to jump in the conversation. I don't know what you said there, Dave, but but uh, it, whatever it was, it was not supported by Amazon. So. <laughs> so, so Keith, how did second season turn into play? Uh, how did that happen? Uh, I started, uh, so I guess it goes back to Jim Gordon's uh, sports game uh, message board back in the late 90s. Uh, was you know kind of one of those one of those bulletin boards. Uh, I guess you kind of mm-hmm. have, have to have experienced that to know what I'm talking about. Um, and I got I got subscribed to that, and so I would get messages. And I mentioned you know I've got this football game that I'm working on, and oh I'd like to you know, people would say oh I'd like to play that, so I would send it to them, and they would play, and then and the word kind of spread, and uh. Pretty soon I was, you know, mailing out copies to, to people and I, you know, had to start charging people. I could, I'd sort of go and broke mailing, mailing all this, going to Kinko's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so uh, um, Pete Ventura, Ventura, who was also, you know, part of the, the uh, that that group, 
uh, he and I struck up a friendship and he suggested that I, you know, I start like my own company for it. And I thought, ah, I was busy with my radio career at the time. Was oh, that what you did? Yes. I was a disc jockey for, uh, for many, many years. Were, were uh, you a Wolfman Jack? You can tell I us. Was not Wolfman. I would have loved to have been Wolfman Jack. He's, he's uh, one of my, he actually was the inspiration for my radio career watching American graffiti. Uh, that's when I decided seeing Wolfman Jack's like, I want to be a disc jockey. That's what I so what'd, you, what'd you spend all these kind? What, no, I was top a top forty disc jockey for many where, years. I worked whereabouts in, in the Denver well, I area. Worked, I, I uh, my first my big I worked a bunch of small stations first. Got my big break in Houston. Worked at ninety three Q KKBQ in Houston. Wow. Went to, went to uh, WPLJ in New York. Uh, worked there with KDWB in Minneapolis, and then I uh, went back to uh, I did Christian radio in Long Island for a year. Then I did okay. country in Washington D C at WMCQ. And then I went back to Top 40, moved back to Dallas, and worked at the KISS FM in Dallas uh, with Kid Craddock for six, seven years. And then I switched over to The Wolf in Dallas, uh, 99.5 The Wolf, and then I came to Denver. So and, and so, so my, I, I did Top 40 for the, until I got too old to do Top 40. I did Top 40 until I was about, I guess, 40, 42, 43 there's an uh, age where you just become too old for that kind of music. Yeah, I mean, I I still enjoyed it, but you know, I didn't. I think the the station kind of got le- leery of sending me out to high school. Is like there's this old guy. This guy is forties. You know, I mean, they want to they want to be uh, you know contemporary. Hearing Dan Ingram air checks from the mid eighties is kind of cringe. Yeah, because he was in his fifties at that point. But right. anyway. Dan Ingram, Dan Taylor does a really good Dan Ingram impersonation. I, I knew Dan uh, D- Dan Taylor when uh, I was working in New York and living in living in Stanford. Uh, anyway, so all I had to say, yeah, I did I did top forty for many years. Then when I got too old for that, then I did uh, I did the country and oldies and and hot AC and Christian, uh, and then I did uh, what else did I do? I, I did pretty much done everything, you know, and then the radio. Gravy trained. Well, the, you know, the, the life of a disc jockey is moving from one city to another. Right. Like, like John, you know, Doctor Johnny Fever on WKRP. You know, town to town, up and down the dial. That's that is that's reality for a disc jockey. So we got to Denver, and when it came time to move, we said, you know what, we're staying here. We're not moving. So that's when I started uh, or restarted play games. But did, anyway, back to the original did, did any question. of those skills or experience that you had with the, the, the disc jockey, did any of those come in to, to play with the gaming thing that you're doing now? I, I would say yes, uh, definitely. Uh, as a top 40 disc jockey, um, you had to be concise. You had 15 seconds over a record intro to say it, and that's it, and it was unforgiving because that vocal would start, and you better be done. You had to be done. You know, you, you did not have the opportunity to say, well, hold on, let me finish what I'm saying. So you had you had to learn how to be concise and, and, and you had to get timing down. And so con- concision is something that I think uh, it, concision with narrative is, is something that's very important in, in radio, particularly top 40 radio. And I feel like that has transferred over into like the sports game thing where you can tell a story. Uh, on, on a line of a chart, you know, rather than just like putting a number there, uh, you know, say something like, you know, tackle for a two yard loss or, or, you know, twists forward for a three yard gain or something like that. You can, you can, you know, you can be concise, tell a story, but in a, in a, a, sh- a short manner. Also, so, I think the, the idea of, uh, of, uh, you know, keeping things moving. Uh, so is that some, something that's in the back of your head as you design some of these games? Because if someone wasn't familiar with, with play.com games, um, they're very different style wise as opposed to the strats and the appas. You know, they're characteristic and the, you know, story driven. You know, you look up the result and it, it tells you that. Was that something that was maybe subconscious from, from your days in trying to get in the, the weather, your joke, and, uh, yeah. where, and where yeah. the traffic is backed up on the Landry? Yeah. Exactly. I, I would say it was subconscious. It certainly wasn't conscious. I, I think, you know, because I was a disc jockey for a long time before, you know, play games uh, came on the scene. But I, I do feel like, you know, and that, to, to Dave's point, I do feel like that that was, it, you know, it was part of the way I do it because of my uh, my radio background. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the, the concision, you know, tell, telling a story in a short period of time and keeping things moving, are that's all very much an important part of, 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 uh, of radio. Um, 
so I, I would say that that uh, yeah, it did it did impact in that way. Uh, I, I also think um, you know I, 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 I had the privilege of working at a lot of really great stations. Uh, 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 five, I worked at five different uh, stations of the year, radio stations of the year. Oh wow! Nice. Industry, yeah, five different ones. Uh, you know, uh, Kiss and, and KWB and and uh, KYGO here in Denver and uh, and the Wolf and uh, and uh, what was the other one? Oh, and, and KABQ. So those are all, each one of those. While I was there, was Station of the Year uh, for their format. Um, and part of that, uh, part of the reason for that is their marketing. You know, their marketing and their you know their their understanding of the people they're trying to reach with their product. Uh, rather than just making a great product, you also have to recognize who's consuming your product and why are they why they're consuming their product mm-hmm. and what they want out of your product and what and what you, know, you can give them that's different. So there's there's, there's all those stations really uh, you know uh, emphasized uh, the whole the, the whole marketing mix. Now I got my degree in advertising and marketing, so you know that that part has always been super interesting to me also. Uh, mm-hmm. But but I, to see it in action uh, at these at these radio stations was also very helpful. I think in in how I approach you know what I do with with, with play games. Okay. Oh, fantastic. Okay. That that, that makes a lot of sense um, because obviously CHR or top forty, um, you know, targets to a younger audience. It's a lot more impressionable to to consuming the product that you're offering them as opposed to oldies, you know, where, you know, it, where it doesn't. What, what, Ron, you, have to, you have to say what CHR contemporary hit radio for those that don't know what's right. Right. Uh, yes. Contemporary the modern day top 40, it's which contempor- is CHR. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I, I would, when I did the college station, we'd sit there and read radio and records. Oh yeah, yeah. The the radio industry bible. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So you went into the uh, the second season. Was that the first game? Well, that's the first game that I I I finished. Uh, Pete, you know, Pete suggested I make a website and offer it. uh, You know, as an actual product. I did. I did that, and and I also figured as long as I got the website going, I I had a couple other game ideas that I've been working on. I had a wrestling game, uh, Face the Mat. Uh, which I put together, uh, sort of, uh, it just kind of came together on a, on a, on a, a whim almost, uh, we were, it was doing an appearance for, for KDWB and we had these WWF action figures, you know, Brutus, the barber beefcake and Hulk Hogan. And, and, uh, on the, on the back, on the back of the package, it was like a bubble wrap package. And on the back of the package it had, had all the, all the, uh, characters, you know, all the different, uh, uh, wrestlers in the series and they had a little illustration and I thought, Oh, that's pretty neat. Like they, they make a great game, you know? And I just got to thinking, how can you make a wrestling game? And so I came up with this wrestling game and I played with it with a friend of mine at church and he thought it was great. And his son played it. And we, and, uh, and so I had the basic bones in place for that game. And then I also had this space alien, this, uh, this uh, space alien game called first contact your town that I had developed. that was uh, sort of like a B movie uh, you know, invasion of the body snatchers type game. And so I put them all, I figured as long as I'm doing the football game, I might as well put the other games on there too. So that's how play launched uh, on January 1, 2000 with wow. second season, uh, face of the mat and first contact your town. Oh, that's well, happy 25. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, 25 yeah. Years, right? yeah. We have a guy in the chat room, Keith, his name is Steve tower and he's asking Steve. what, what, what all these games are all about. He's never heard of them before. That's funny. Steve is such a good friend of, 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 of mine personally and also of our company. Steve and I met in person uh, at the World Board Game Championships in 2013. Oh, really? Uh, okay. he, he made the trip down from Boston. I, I made the trip from Denver. Uh, I, I drove the whole way. I don't know if I could do that uh, anymore. I drove all the way from Denver to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, and, and had a little booth there. And Steve drove down from Boston to kind of hang out that weekend, and, and we got to be good friends there. We played our the first uh, college all second season college all star game together uh, there, and uh, ever since then we've we've uh, I don't know we just kind of connect. He's he's such a great guy, and uh, really really value his friendship and just love him as a person and his family, his wife Jen and his kids Sonny and Cora. There, it's a great family. Really yeah, good people. Yeah, we, we, we've had him on the show a couple of times. Ironically, 
Steve's been on the show twice, and it was a hundred episodes apart exactly. Wow! And so he's booking for the next <laughs> the next time, which well, is now, how about, three years, but it's it, yeah. he'll be on two ninety one. Yeah, Dave, you and you and Steve are pretty close, aren't you? In terms of distance, in, in vicinity, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think we're in driving. And you've business. never gotten together in person? No, no. And that's oh, something. There's no excuse for that. And this is something we were talking about off the air before we started the show tonight was uh, people have been, you know, talking about, well, I don't say bugging me, but they've been dropping little bugs in my ear about, I need to start something here on the East Coast where we can just have a, a, a gathering of, of, you know, cards and dice or sports sim people. And, and that's something that we're taking very seriously. We might be doing something. So I might have to talk to Steve about that and, you know, what what he thinks. is I, I haven't been to any of the conventions yet. So, I mean, that's something that I'm, I'm seriously considering doing is, is trying to – I don't know if it would be a digital to dice one or if it would just be a, uh, you know, a, a board game convention or whatever it is. But, yeah, you know, it's something we Well, there's do. something about playing, uh, you know, to enjoying the hobby in person. I mean, you know, this is great to be able to talk to you via, you know, d- digital means. And, of course, you've got plenty of – social media where people can post the results and, you know, and, and post comments, but it just doesn't, there's just, it's just not the same as being in the same room face to face with somebody playing a game with them. Uh, and being, then being amongst a group of other people yeah. who are doing the same thing. There's a dynamic at play there that is uh, very difficult to put into words, but it is, it's very real. And, uh, once you've experienced it, you won't forget it. Yeah, it's something I definitely want to do. Um, Speaking of conventions, Keith, don't you have an announcement? <laughs> Nicely done, Ron. You're well, welcome. We, we we talk about how how so so we wanted to have Dave come uh, to the, be our uh, speaker at, at Play.com 2024, uh, but you know his wife's health situation was kind of tenuous, and and so glad that that's you know working out for you, Dave. Just the answer to prayer. But uh, so we we made it a point to to. Uh, put him first in line for the 2025 convention. So uh, assuming all, all things go well on your end, we're planning to have Dave as being our, our keynote speaker Woo-hoo! for for the uh, Play.com 2025. So I appreciate Yay! that. And, okay, so now uh, to those that are aware, like like even myself who've never been, what is the Play.com? What, what, what is it? What can I expect? Uh, you know, it is – we put it on our, our, our shirt here. I think it says – I don't know if you see it on my shirts. Is the the best uh, the best weekend in in sports tabletop sports gaming, and it really is. Uh, you know, we get together. Uh, it's almost not even about the games anymore. It's all. It's really more about just uh, about hanging out with people who who have the same passion as you do. Uh, you know, we've all had the experience of trying to explain our hobby to other people who don't know what we're doing, and they, they give you that blank look, like, oh, that's. Yeah, that's nice. You know, they don't really get it. No, they don't. Uh, but to be am- amongst uh, you know a group of people who do get it, it's there's just something you know indescribably uh, satisfying about that. So uh, we set up a, a schedule. Uh, it, it's it's officially a two day thing, uh, Friday and Saturday. Uh, but really, it's more like a five or six day thing. Uh, we we uh, we have a, a, a pre con picnic that we do Thursday night before the convention. And uh, so once we started, once we did that, everybody wanted to be here Wednesday in order to, um, you know, make sure they're here for Thursday's activities. So when that started happening, we said, well, let's do something on Wednesday for the early bird arrivals. We'll, we'll have some sort of an organized event. We'll, you know, have a little reception. We'll get together, we'll play some games. So when we did start doing that, then people said, well, I got to get here Tuesday then so that I don't miss the Wednesday thing. And so that's, that's, that's kind of where we're at right now, where people start getting here like on Tuesday or even Monday, you know, and then, so it's really almost like a week long thing. And many hang out Sunday as well. Uh, but the uh, actual official organized events are, are, uh, Thursday night and then Saturday, uh, uh, Friday and Saturday. And we, we have learned, you know, this is our, we, this was our sixth convention. So as we've done it more, we, we've gotten, I think, uh, better at it. Uh, we've learned that, that, that space is good, to have some breathing room. The first couple of conventions, man, we packed it in. Oh, we sure packed did. in lots of activities. We had like one hour lunch breaks, you know, it's like you get 45 minutes, better be back here, you know, because we're starting this next thing. And we would run sometimes two or three things at the same time. You know, uh, we've learned though that, that, that having a little breathing room is nice. So we have, 
maybe fewer fewer activities and, and they're more spaced apart, but that gives people time to do their own activities um, and, uh, and and just hang out, just chill out. Uh, so uh, we also, I mean, we, we the, the, the activities are fun. We do a, an annual golf tournament. Uh, where we, you know, it's like the highlight of the, of the convention where we, we play the golf game. We, we have a course, we have a different course every year. They, usually it's a, it's a custom course. Uh, and we let everybody make their own card. We've, we've guidelines as to, you know, what you can, you know, what, what qualities you can choose, how many you can choose. And then we play, we, it's a two round tournament where we play first round that we reorganize with the leaders going last. And then it's always, it's always dramatic. Uh, and, and uh, so we have that. We have we have a, the time machine tournament for baseball with baseball game, uh, and then we usually do a couple of other other things too uh, that vary from year to year. So just to kind of keep it different, usually we have some new release or uh, some new thing that we're doing that we, you know, we, we try to make it so that if you come to the convention, you're going to experience something that nobody else gets to experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we always try to have something that you know people get to experience for the first time at the convention. Uh, so that makes it special. Um, and other than that, it's just, uh, it's just, you know, three, four days of hanging out with people that love sports board games, just like we do. And it's more than just the play games, right? Yes. We, we, uh, have expanded it, uh, you know, in, in recent years to include other games, other companies, uh, you know, we, we, uh, the, the tournaments that we run, obviously they're, you know, we're not in a position to run a Stratomatic tournament on our, on our own, mm-hmm. but you know, like uh, last year, Glenn Guzzo came from the Stratomatic community and he had a little Stratomatic event at his table during, we have a, we have a Friday night session uh, each year. Uh, we, we usually have a panel discussion. So, so what, what will happen next year is Dave, you'll do your presentation on Friday evening. And then after that, for, for the rest of the evening, we'll break up into groups and we'll have all these different guest designers. You'll have your own table to do what you want to do. If, if you want to, uh, uh, but the other other guest designers like Grant Fines from from Forty Nine Sports Games, uh, we had Clay Dresslock from uh, Season Ticket this past year. Um, we had uh, we had Jeff Giordano from the Apple Community two years ago or, or last year. Um, so and they get their own table and they can run whatever they do whatever they want. You yes. know, have their own little tournament if they want to have a tournament or or just play some games or, or whatever they want to do. So yes, we. Uh, we had Gary Brown from Stone Mountain Press. Oh, great! Uh, yeah, gosh, we had, we, had, we had Joe Bryan. Joe Bryan from Sideline Strategy was there this year. Great! Uh, he was showing off his new. He's working on a, a diecast racing uh, game with like die, Hot Wheels cars. Nice! Oh, uh, cool! So yeah, it's it's super neat. So yes, it's more than just play. It's like a it's like a uh, it's like a sports game community event. Nice. Are there snacks? Do they have snacks? Bring your own snacks. Sorry. Ooh. We, they, yeah, see, you know, we used to serve food, but the, the hotel changed their rules. So they? They, they, they they opened up a restaurant on site. And once they did that, it's like, okay, can't bring food in here anymore. So we cannot bring food. We used to serve We used to serve dinner. Uh, oh, really? we, we bring, we do a pizza party. You know, say, you don't need to go anywhere. Just keep playing. Here's pizza. Yeah. Just go get it. So, you know, it made for more gameplay, but we can't do that anymore. So. <laughs> Small concession. Steve says, "Don't forget Mike Fitzgerald being." There. That's right. Mike Fitzgerald is is there every year. We uh, we we just met with Mike actually this past uh, this past week. So t- uh, before we get into people's questions, and a lot of people submitted a lot of good questions when, when we get to that. What um what did you see that needed to be different from the other companies and? Essentially, how did qualities become into play for you? No pun intended there. You know, when, when you came up with the design for, you know, your your basic card, is it like History Maker Baseball and, and, and History Maker Yeah, Ball? these games are very different playing They're games. Statistically, statistically sound, but when you take a first look at them, you're going, well, how do you get, you know, from, from A to B there? What, what kind of caused you to want to go – I'm not being critical at all in any way. No, I, 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 no you're not. Um, um, you know, what, what caused you to go, you know, what was the, the light in your head that said, if I do this, it works the same way, but I'm different, I guess. For well, I didn't set out to be different. Right. Uh, that was not my goal in, in, in using qualities. They just work for me. Uh, I, 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 I really kind of, 
started did that with the wrestling game. When I was working on the wrestling game, this is the 1990s. Uh, I was thinking of how do I how do I uh, uh, you know capture a wrestler's ability? And of course, wrestling really doesn't have statistics to draw right. from. So you pretty much are well. He's powerful. Uh, he's a crowd favorite. Uh, so let's give him that quality. And when he when and when that comes into play, he'll get a, he'll get a benefit. So that's how I started. It was really because of the absence of statistics and the necessity of doing it a different way. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, um, I think, uh, the, the next sports game I did, I want to say the next sports game I did was roller derby. Uh, and, um, because my, my plan, once I started the company, my plan was to, uh, get a foothold in the hobby by offering sports that nobody else offered. Right. Uh, so I went, I went with, uh, I went with, uh, with roller derby was the first one. And eventually I, I did lacrosse. And uh, and bowling, although there are there have been some bowling games, but I I, I did bowling, wrestling, uh, mm -hmm. demolition derby. You know, mm -hmm. so I was doing sports that nobody else was doing. That was kind of my original plan. Uh, so when I went from went to the roller derby game, again statistics scarce. I mean, they do have some statistics, but they're notoriously uh, budged. Yeah, fudged or they don't add up or, you know, uh, a lot of, a lot of times they put stats in a, in a yearbook just kind of so that they could make it seem like it was more real. Uh, so again, stats were really not, you know, not, uh, available. So I went with qualities and, uh, it just seemed to work. And, and, uh, you know, when, when I began working with, uh, with the, with the baseball game in the early two thousands, early prototypes of the baseball game, I, I just, I felt like, well, let's just use qualities for that. Except now I've got some stats to back up these qualities. Now I right. know if, if, you know, this, we'll give this guy the hero quality, which means it's going to represent a, about a 280 batting average, you know. Uh, so, but it, so that's kind of how it got from point A to point B. Okay. Okay. Hey, um, talk for a minute about head to head versus playing by yourself. When you're designing the ga these games, or even when you're playing these games, is there any difference? Because it's like, you know, when you're playing face-to-face -face with somebody, you know, you have your own strategy. But if you're just playing by yourself, does that ever come into play when you're, when you're thinking about a game or you may be tweaking a game or something like that? Uh, most of the games, yeah, I, I think most of us in the hobby, particularly those who have been in the hobby for a long time, uh, before the Internet, you know, before social media, where I mean, it's pretty easy to connect now with people of similar interests. Right. I mean, it's, there's there's a Facebook group for everything. Right. Uh, but, you know, it didn't always used to be that way. And oh, we're, no. pretty, we're pretty we're pretty isolated as sports gamers back in the '80s and even the '90s. You know, before before the internet became a big deal, most of us played these games by ourselves. We you know occasionally might find somebody to play against, but most of the time we were playing by ourselves. So. Uh, most of the games that I've designed, really all the games I've desi designed, were designed first as solitaire games. And this is what drives my, my son, because my son's part of the business now, and he's a very different gamer. He's very much games are to be played with with more pe with people, you know, other people, you know. And so he gets frustrated when I try to, when I say, hmm, how can we do a solo version of that, you know? He says, well, what do you need a solo version for? That, that defeats the purpose of, this, of playing a game, you know? But for me, it's like, well, that's a natural part of it. It's like, right. I might not have somebody to play against, and I want to be able to play this game. I don't want to have this game that I want to play, and I can't play it because there's nobody to play it with. I, I want to be able to play it by myself. So um, most of the games, really, I, I would say all the games start out designed from the, the time of the, the play classic games, the sports games, you know. Right. Uh, all of those games are des designed uh, first as something that I can entertain myself with. Uh, and then, to varying degrees, they have uh, components added to them, which uh, make them amenable for head-to-head -head play. And, and I'll be the first to admit, some games are better uh, for head-to-head -head play than others. Like the NASCAR game, Red, White, and Blue Racing, that's a, not a real, there's really no way to play that head-to-head. -head. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much a solitaire game, or if you've got multiple people you play, just play cooperatively. You know, you just sit down and you run the race and you just sort of enjoy it together. You're not actually playing. I'm not playing against you. I'm not, you know, manipulating this driver or, or coaching this driver. So that that is on, on one end of the extreme. That it's really not a good 
it's not really a game. It's a sim, you know. Uh, the soccer game also, it has some strategy elements to it, and there are some decisions, but uh, there's, it's not, you know, for head-to-head, it's basically – we, we, you, we sit across the table and watch our teams play, and we have a couple of decision points, but generally speaking, we're, we're watching the players play the game. Uh, football game, on the other hand, is very interactive because, you know, you, you, make your, you make your play call, you make your defense selection. There's lots of uh, crunchy decisions to make, strategic decisions. Do I want to go for it? You know, like, do I want to go for two? I mean, there's, there's, that, that, and that uh, makes for a great head-to-head experience. The baseball game is, sim- is similarly great when you play head-to-head because you've got lots of lots of decisions to make, um, and and I think even more so because of the uh, the strategy cards. They give you they give you manager strategies that typically aren't represented. They're psychological strategies like walking to the mound or coaching up a batter or you know uh, or uh, you know dugout chatter. You know, it's motivational stuff that has a an intangible effect, but but a real effect. Uh, on on player performances, so you get to Im- implement those. So it makes for a really good head-to-head experience. So they're all the games, all the sports teams are designed first as solo games with varying aspects of head-to-head, you know, compatibility uh, after the fact. Okay. What was the idea with bringing in umpires as part of the baseball game? I don't think I've ever seen officials become part of the story. Because uh, I. I don't remember exactly, but I felt like, you know, they're an important part of the game. They impact the game. Uh, you know, everybody knows Don Denkinger's blown call. You know, they, they, they're, they're, they, have their, they have their legendary moments, just like the athletes do. So I felt like it was appropriate that they be represented in the game and that they have an impact on the game. Not overshadow the game, mm-hmm. but a couple times a game, they're going to have some input and it could be, it could be crucial. I remember, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, the highlights of of my career. We did the the uh, World Series preplay uh, where we, we did the in season set. We played at the World Series before it happened. Like it was, this was 2017. It was in Seattle, and uh, uh, the game was won. It was, it was a game seven that was won when the guy went for home and was and was was ruled safe, but was actually out. The umpire missed the call. And they did. The, we did the video review, but the video review was was it was like a, a, a very low percentage roll that it was upheld, but it was upheld. So it was like a super close call. And, and upon you know, we all knew that it was actually out, but it but it, it won the game, and that was just such a memorable moment, you know. So they do have their they do have their moments, and I'm really I'm really glad that the game includes that. Yeah, we had uh, Jay Thomas Hetrick on who wrote a book about the 1899 Cleveland Spiders. Oh, boy. And, and he was going <laughs> off, and we just let him go. He told story after story about 1899 baseball. And there was one play, because back in the day, they would only have two umpires. And if one was too hungover, they had one umpire, okay? Right. And he, he told a story about the Spiders were playing a game, and, and the other team hit the ball down the line. It was a fair ball, and it went into foul territory. And there were people who used to sit on the grass. You know, and watch the game. Right. And, and this big fat guy sat on the ball, would not get up, and the spider outfield is trying to push him off to get the ball. And the guy went around and got the home run before the guy got off the ball. <laughs> but that That's was hilarious. that was a story that he told there. But and then the umpire, there's nothing the umpire could do about it. You know, he's just like you know, it's just you know, the fan sitting on the ball. What do you want me to do? You know. Right. So right. The, yeah, so different things like that come into play. Um. I think just if I can interject for a second, you know, baseball, when you really step back and think about it, baseball is so much more. I mean, baseball, numbers and statistics are important for baseball. They're crucial for baseball. But you take a step back. There's so much more to baseball history and, and tradition than just mm-hmm. the numbers. And, you know, I think it's neat w- when a game can capture, you know, more than just the numbers. Uh, and I think it's a pr- entirely appropriate. You a baseball fan growing up? I did follow the Brewers. We lived in Wisconsin. I, they moved. I, I remember when they moved from Seattle to Milwaukee. It was a ex- very exciting day. Uh, it's like, wow, we're gonna have our own team. So I I listened to many many hours of Merle Harmon and Bob Euchre in the in the broadcast booth. Uh, so yes, I was a baseball fan, definitely. Nice. Where, where are you here right now at play games with it being fun and it being work where is that line today for you 
Uh, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question. Uh, I would say it is fun. I would say uh, it is it is more and more <laughs> more and more work. Uh, it, it, it's become uh, there's been, become more work to do. Um, uh, but if it ever gets to be more work than fun, then I'll have to figure out something else different to do with it because it really should be. I am a big believer in, uh, you know, enjoying what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what was it? I think it's the the ancient Chinese saying that if you, uh, find something you love to do, you'll never work a day in your life, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And, and that's, that's what I really feel blessed, you know, in my life to, first of all, as a radio disc jockey, it's hard to consider that work, you know, Mm -hmm. although, you know, it, it was work, but it was so much fun. And I, I get the same, even, really even more satisfaction uh, from the, the, the game world than I got from my radio career. And, and I got a lot of satisfaction from my radio career. So, oh, Fantastic. Uh, let's see, I get one, another question for you here. And this is something that we've been talking with game developers kind of off to the side. We might do a whole show on this and, and, and have some people on to talk about this. Uh Printing costs versus PDF. That seems to be a very hot topic here. Is that there's some people like like Grant? I think was saying he's getting away from the print and going PDF only. And I think Gary was talking about that too. I, 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 that, yeah. I could be mixing sure. them up, but we've no, been no, talking. Right. We've been talking to them, and they're saying that you know I know some companies don't want to do any PDF. You guys do a mix of print and PDF sales. Uh, it, but they're saying that the print is just getting so expensive, and then the the shipping, and the, the, what they have to charge to make it worthwhile, it, it's it's kind of frustrating them, and it's frustrating the customers. But at the same time, you know, you get the PDF, which is can be easily pirated too. Right. Uh, so I don't know how to really go beyond what you just said. That that basically is that all those things are true. Uh, printing costs are extremely prohibitive shipping costs extremely prohibitive and and you know other things like dice buying dice uh and uh i mean even even bubble wrap you know all the things that we have to purchase to uh to uh you know ship stuff it's not just the postage you know it's not just the 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 actually the amount that you have to charge to ship something which is substantial i mean the postal service just raised their rates again here uh two weeks ago uh, so that is substantial, but also the cost of shipping materials, you know, um, is, is, is getting more and more expensive as well. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's tough. And, and PDFs are, are, are a solution, but that kind of puts the printing on, on the end user and then they have to bear those costs and then they, they've got to go to Kinko's or whatever and have it printed and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, um, absorb those expenses themselves. And also I will say, uh, you know, you want to put out a, an attractive product. You want to put out an attractive card with lots of color and lots of, you know, lots of graphic value. And, you know, you want to have some, some, some intrinsic value in, in the product you're selling. But, but the, the catch 22 to that is if you're doing it as a PDF, then you know, somebody buys the PDF, they've got to print it, and they're paying all, they're either draining their, their toner cartridge, you know, and it gets to the point where they don't want to print it because it's good. They know yeah. that they're going to have to go and buy another toner cartridge. So then it's frustrating for them. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a frustrating situation. We have a, a printing uh, operation set up in, in our basement here. So we print our own stuff. It's a, it is, a, you know, a, a high-end finisher called a Duplo. Uh, which does our perforation because perforation is extremely expensive as well uh, to have it perforated and then shipped and then printed on. <clears throat> so we, we, uh, we do it all in house now and have for the last, this is our third year doing it ourselves. Wow. Uh, where if I could pick up my computer, I'd show you our, our, uh, our, our machines. Um, so uh, we're able to, you know, we're able to do it basically at wholesale rather than, retail. Uh, whereas, you know, for, for many years we, we paid retail price for print stuff and then we had to sell it for retail plus, you know, in order to make, make any kind of a, you know, make it worth doing. So, you know, we're, we are able to print, uh, and, and, uh, finish stuff, uh, because we have our own operation in our, in our basement. In fact, we were, we've been printing grant stuff for him, you know, okay. uh, he's been purchasing it from us. 
Um, but it's still, it's hard. It's hard to make it hard to make a go of it when you're having to, uh, you know, pay, pay a retail versus wholesale. That must come know? into play when you're de- either designing new games or designing seasons or designing cards or express versions of the game is, you know, how much ink are you using on, you know, the cards or the charts or whatever. I, I know Ron and I, you know, we, we do a lot of game testing and people will send us stuff we'll take a look at. And there's been a few times where people have sent us games to check out. And I and I would get back to them and says, quite honestly, I says, I would go through all the ink I have in my house just to print out your charts. It they they look great. They look fantastic. They're unbelievable. Yeah. But my red cartridge is going to be gone by the time yeah. I print out this full page of red with white text. So it yeah. says you might want to either have a black and white version or t- tone down the color and and we were honest about that it's like you know and so it's like you know we need to that needs to be like i say when you're designing stuff you got to keep in mind boy this looks great on the computer how do i get this it's got to be printed you know and someone's got to use that ink whether it's you or uh, staples or whoever and that that just raises the cost too so i imagine that you know it's got to be some kind of a friendly design now a printer friendly design when you're doing some of these things if you're doing pdf if you're offering as a pdf product yes if you're gonna offer a pdf product you've got to have something that's printable so like like we will do um um uh like a black and white version and a color version for some of our sets like the like the the baseball america set we have a we have a deluxe color version that has team names and stuff like that and we have also a black and white version so if you want to you know if you and, and and when you buy the pdf you get both so if you want the color and, and want to drain your toner cartridge go for it you want to save some some ink and just do the black and white, which is you know minimal. You can do that. So yeah, you do have to keep that in mind with PDF products. When, when we're making it ourselves though, and printing it ourselves, then we want it to be as nice as we can mm-hmm. because you know that's what you would want. Mm-hmm. You, know, you would want it to be as nice as possible. Yep. Now let me see. You do the sports games. I have a bunch of them. I don't have all, of them, but I have a lot of them. And then you do some non-sports games, right? So didn't you right. split up about a year or two ago that you have like a play classic now? And, and talk about that. Uh, so we, yes. So this actually goes back uh, at least five years. We, we recognized that um, our, our sense was that, um, well, our mission statement has always been, if, since day one, January 1, 2000, our mission statement has always been, you know, preserving and advancing the grand pastime of tabletop sports. So, you know, I think we've done, it's, it's one thing to preserve. That's great. But how do you advance it? And one of the things is to, you know, is to uh, go into new forms of sports games. And also, it, it, parenthetically to that, uh, you know, to, to have different kinds of, of, of non-sports games, uh, adopting the, some of the, some of the, the things that we've done in sports games, some of the, some of the mechanics that we've used successfully in sports games, a- apply them in a non-sports context in order to grow the audience. And the idea would be somebody uh, who's maybe an Amelia Earhart fan, who, who's a history fan, they mm-hmm. might get, you know, aviatrix, play the game, enjoy the game, go back and say, Oh, look, there's a golf game. I think I'll try that. So it grows the, it grows the audience, grows the, the audience in, in that way, uh, in a different way than just trying to go for sports people. I think that, um, you know, the sports board game audience is, you know, it's limited. It's a niche audience. It's kind of a niche within a niche. Right. Uh, you no. Know, uh, and so in order for it to be sustainable, we need to, we need to bring more people to the party. And so that is one of our strategies to bring more people to the party, uh, to expand into non-sports games and hopefully, you know, get them to, you know, produce games that they're going to enjoy. And then when they enjoy them, come back and maybe try one of the sports games. And, and we're confident that they'll try those and enjoy those as well. Uh, so that's the strategy between, you know, the, the play now and the play, the play classic titles. You they're must all, be – I'm sorry, no, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead and finish. I was going to say, they're all on the same site now. We did split them off into separate sites at first, but then we, uh, frankly, it became too much work trying to maintain two sites. So, you know, we're doing a lot of duplication. So we just put everything on the same site. It's all under play.com. And then you can to- toggle down on the site whether you want to go to play classic or play now. But they're all presented in the same place. You must be thrilled, or I hope you're thrilled, that your style of gaming has been uh, 
carried on by Al Wilson and, and Gary Brown, for instance, fascinating baseball, uh, Al's football game, the, the drive-by-drive game, Gary's hockey game and soccer game also have a lot of character qualities type play too. I mean, that's clearly you've been a huge influence in those designs. Well, Al is my best friend. Uh, I love Al dear, dearly. Uh, and he's, uh, has been just so instrumental in, uh, in everything that we've done. Uh, I remember flying to San Diego to visit him in uh, 2013 and, uh, you know, we just instantly kind of clicked. And, um, so I'm, I'm pleased that he, I'm, I'm pleased that he's, you know, going in the direction that he's going in. And as far as Gary, Gary, Gary and I go way, way back. We both lived in Dallas. Uh, I, I met Gary even before play.com, you know, we, he, as part of the, of, of Jim Gordon's, uh, you know, the bulletin board, we just discovered that we both lived in Dallas. Uh, uh, Gary was in the telecom biz. I was in the radio biz and we just start getting together and playing, you know, we, we get together once a month, he'd come over to our house over there on rolling Hills lane in Dallas and uh, we'd play games. And so, you know, Gary goes back even farther. He's an old, old friend of mine. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased that how influential I've been. I don't know that I've been that influential. They're both, they're both pretty sharp guys uh, on their own. So hmm. anything that I've <laughs> brought to their, you know, their enterprises is probably coincidental. Nice. Before, I, before we get into the user questions, I don't know, Dave, how much more you have. I have one more to... question for him, and then, yeah, we'll get into the questions that we were sent in. And anybody in the chat room, if you have any questions, you can stop posting them now. We'll we'll, uh, we'll get Keith answering those for uh, you. Go ahead and ask that. And then... All right, so, so you're doing the non-sports games. Uh, and I can only imagine that, that people, you know, friends, customers, whatever, contacting you and they're saying, you know, Hey, you know what would be a great idea for a game is this, what's the craziest game someone's pitched to you that, that they suggested you make? The, oh my gosh, the craziest game that somebody's pitched to me. Uh, let me go to my desktop. <laughs> Hold on. I don't know. Uh, Look, a couple crazy right ones. Here. I mean, I imagine people saying, "Hey, Keith, you got to make a game about you know you ants, do a casino ants, casino dealer sim, yeah, or something like that. ants wrecking a picnic or something like that." You know, most no, I, I don't get a lot of people submitting those ideas. Uh, I would say, you know, I've, I've gotten everything from pickleball to uh, to Australian rules football to uh, uh, Tour side bicycle, bicycle racing tour the Tour de France or whatever bicycle race, um, uh, what else? Uh, curling, um, rugby. None of those are, are are in and of themselves weird or, or wacky. Um, I just think of more along like the non sports games because you, you some, know, some of those are Olympic sports. You know, so. yeah. we we we've gotten the submissions for like an an, an anarchy game. Where you know uh, civilization is turned over by anarchists. Um, again, it's probably really if you look at the at the board, the general board game hobby, you'd be astounded at at what games have been made already. It's like there are no wacky ideas. It's probably there's probably already a game out there that that you know that has that theme. Uh, so uh, I don't know that we, I've got really got anything more more crazy than try, you, 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 uh, probably as soon as we sign off, I'll remember. I'll think of, <laughs> of, of something that I uh, that I uh, received and, and I said I should. I'll probably say I should have mentioned that to Dave. Uh, it doesn't. It, it escapes me right now. Other than what I just mentioned, I do have a folder on my desktop for games users submitted games uh, that I can just go to and look at. Have you ever gotten one that you've published? Um, have we gotten one that we published? No. Well, we did, we did Planet Flipper, which was uh, a playing out title, uh, from Daryl Durston. We met Daryl at Dice Tower West and he pitched that game idea to us. And then, and we did scorecards, which is Mike Fitzgerald's game. Um, so yes, we have, I guess we have done, we have not done any sports games that have been pitched to us. Okay. But, and most of the, I will say most of the sports games that are pitched to us are based on our own game engines. Mm-hmm. They're not some, it's not a game that somebody's come up with on their own. It's a game that's, they, they'll take like soccer blast and switch it to Australian rules football. So 
Um, so, so you know, we haven't gotten any new game submission ideas uh, that we, that we've implemented. Cool. Okay. All right. So, Scotty from Bellingham, Washington, asks, "How do you come up with all the fictional names you put into your fictional leagues?" <sighs> he messaged me that question by uh, Mr. Howard. He messaged me that question when when we said that you were going to be on. Is that D. Scott Howard. That 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 is D. That is D. Scott D. Howard. D. Scott Howard. I know D. Scott Howard. Uh, so. It's. I'm not sure how how I want to answer that. Um, it's a, it's a there's no there's no set way of doing it. Generally speaking, though, it's a it's a mix of 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 uh, of uh, what's the word I want of considerations. Okay. Uh, number one, the sport. You want to have an ethnic mix that matches the ethnic mix of the sport. That's mm-hmm. that's important. Uh, second of all, you want to have uh, a name set that matches the era. So, for example, I just did the 1954 Century League, uh, and people named their kids different names in the 50s than oh, they sure. did than they do in the 2000s. So that has to come into consideration. I mean, when's the last time you saw a kid named Mary? That's my mother's name, and she was born in '52. But when's the last time you saw a kid? Named- oh, well, we have Mary Mary Supernaut from from uh, from the Supernaut family it comes to our convention every year. She's okay. like twelve. Okay. So there are some Marys, but like, what about like Hazel, or it, for guys' names like Elmer? Nobody names their kids. Oh no. Or or Horace is another name that's that's uh, you know. They, somebody. I, I, I watched a, a, a an online thing one time. Uh, this guy is able to. He's a he's a name he's, he, he's a name specialist. He studies names. That's his thing, and he can tell you he can tell you when you were born within like ten years based on what your name is. Uh, and it's it's astounding, you know. Now, if your name is John, I don't, I don't know. He, he probably has to. Good luck it. with that. Yeah. I mean, that's not yeah. you know right. But but if your name is you know Kelsey or or uh, Stacy or you know uh, Jared, you know he he knows when those names were, were popular. So anyway, that's cut off the point. Uh, so that comes. So those factors come into play, um, and you want to have a mix of names that is reflective of the actual distribution names. So, so, you know, there's, there are certain names like Williams and Johnson and Smith that are common. You're going to find those names in every sport. Uh, then there are other names that are, you know, that you, they're just like, Whoa, I've never seen anybody with that last name before. So you, you want to have the proper mix of names uh, based on familiarity, general, you know, uh, general use in the population, but also have, have names that are, uh, you know, unique and and um, memorable. So all those factors come into play. Software driven. It's ones that you 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 come up with by yourself, or I generally do it by myself. <sighs> yeah. Do you ever drop in any Easter egg names? I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> Never. You, you won't get me to admit them, though. You'll have to find them on your own. <laughs> Nice. Uh, let's see. Okay, I got one over here from David C. Will there be any more cold snap seasons produced, new or a past? We Dave Gambrel is uh, continues to make the uh, the CFL seasons, the current CFL season. We just we posted the twenty three season uh, back in May, or was it? I think it was early June. Uh, and David is uh, very you know dedicated to to keeping that going. Um, as for past seasons. Um, I'm forgetting his name. He's in Wisconsin. Joe, um, I forget his last name. I, I'll remember it as soon as we as soon as we sign off. He's done a lot of the of the uh, vintage seasons from the '80s and, and '70s and '90s. So the market for Canadian football, unfortunately, is is just not that strong. Um, I've had a number of discussions with people offline about about that. Um, and, and remember, I, I was talking about how uh, when I started play games after the radio thing, you know, uh, ended and we decided to stay here in Denver looking for sports that nobody was doing. Canadian football was one of them. 
So I, uh, you know, that's where, where Cold Snap was part of that strategy. Um, Joe, Joe Pritchard, I'm seeing. Joe Pritchard, that's right, Joe Pritchard, yes. Big Blue Bombers fan. I can't, I'm, I'm, Joe, if you're watching, I'm, I'm sorry I forgot your last name. But yes, Joe Pritchard is the, uh, has made several vintage uh, CFL seasons. Uh, but there's just, not, there's just not the demand for it. Um, coupled with the fact that there's you know enough uh, freebies uh, to to keep people satisfied, it's hard to justify spending the time to create new CFL vintage CFL seasons. Um, I, I'm not I'm not sure what the future of Cold Snap is. Um, I think I, I, I think not to, not to get into a, 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 a get off the course on the discussion. I, I wish the CFL did a better job of marketing themselves. It's a fantastic game. It should be way more popular here in the United States than it is. I don't know why it's not. Uh, I think that, you know, just getting on my soapbox, I think when the CFL expanded in the U S in the nineties, that was the right thing to do. It was amazing. The people 30 years later who still talk about Baltimore. I went to, to watch the San Antonio Texans play. I saw Baltimore play in San Antonio at the Alamo dome. It was so funny. We stood up and sang the game. How did they, did they, was that field big enough for those end zones? It was. Yeah, the Alamo, Dome end was, zones in the, CFL. the Alamo Dome was actually built, I believe, with the idea that they might get a, a, a CFL team. So it is it is big enough for that, yes. Uh, but the weirdest thing was standing for the Canadian National Anthem in, in San Antonio, Texas, with two <laughs> American teams playing. But, you know, that was part of the CFL. Do you procedure. think the uh, – it's because of the three downs versus the four downs. Jeez, that makes it more exciting or what? That that might what you, well, I mean, because you really can't have a running game. You get one play and then it's basically third you down. Can, no, you can't have a running game because the field is so much wider. There's so much more space to run. It's twelve it's, on it's twelve. An outside so. running game though, uh, and 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 you know you also have that yard in between yep. the two lines uh, that you don't have in the NFL which makes it easier to create a hole and, and get through. So I, I do also, feel like you also have multiple men in motion too. So, yes, you you can. Know. so it's, it's a fantastic game. I think that, uh, you know, to, to, to finish my point, I, I feel like expanding into the U S was, a, was a, the right thing to do. Uh, but it would have made it, I, I think it might've killed the Canadian identity, uh, which the, the, the owners did not want to do. And there were also problems with the, uh, you know, they've got, they've got rules in place. Uh, for how many the Canadian teams have to have a certain number of Canadian players, or actually there's a limit as to how many American players they can have, but the American teams didn't have that same restriction. So it was a kind of a competitive imbalance. So there were problems that needed to be addressed, but ultimately, you know, I think the league could have been successful because it's a fantastic game. And, you know, now it's, it doesn't feel like, you know, it, it feels like the CFL is shrinking on the on the national, you know, the the sports scene. Do you, do you, do you think you need? Yeah. Like, I don't know. I, I've seen the, the Canadian football on TV. Like I say, the ESPN once in a while will have it. I I don't know all about it or all the rules as much as I do. I'm mean, obviously American football. Do, do you think you have to have a good grasp of that game to play any kind of Canadian football game, whether it's cold snap mm-hmm. or, or anything else like that? No, no, it's, it's the, the not really. I think the the rules are. are it's, it's, it is football. It's re- easily recognizable as football. The main differences are it's a bigger field, uh, and you've got only three downs instead of four. And that's what makes the game great, is that it's only three downs. Uh, it, it forces you to – it makes every play much more urgent. Uh, and, uh, I mean, I think that's the key to what makes the game so great. Well, And, and the extra space is nice, too. Um, so it takes it's a different kind of athlete and a different kind of uh, – skill set, different kind of strategy. Um, but it's a very, very exciting game. And um, I, I think in terms of, f- from a board game perspective, there's nothing that you really need to, uh, there's no asterisks you need to put in there. It, it plays it plays great as a board game as well. It's the same kind of strategic decision-making. Uh, and it, it's, it's super fun. Was that a whole new game from the ground up compared to? No. No, it's basically second season. Uh, with uh, adapted for Canadian football. Okay. If you if you know if you know second season, you'll instantly be familiar with Cold Snap. You'll instantly be able to play it. Okay. All right. Well, when we get some more through some of these questions here, Ron, you got any? For- 
Actually, I didn't have it open. I just oh. sent it to you. So oh, I, 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 to okay, you. I have it open. Um, uh, Adirondack Gus says, my question in, is in regards to the hockey and soccer express games. How much game tweaking did you have to do to keep those scores in normal ranges? Uh, well, yeah, it was quite a bit of tweaking. I mean, essentially, you're you're taking game – each of the so, so the full play game has a certain number of actions that you're resolving in order to get the result. And there are certain percentages that come into play in order to generate the realistic scores uh, based on that number of those that number of resolutions. So with an express game, you're greatly reducing the number of resolutions. So the percentages have to change in order to match that. Uh, and that does require, you know, so, some tweaking. Um I don't know how better to answer that question than that, except to say yes, tweaking okay. is required, and uh, it play you know play testing is, is is essential. Right. Okay. You know, shout out to Michael Owens and, and particularly Michael Owens, but also Neil Maitland and uh, Jewel Sigel, guys that played you know those Express games incessantly. I mean, you know, hundreds of games in order to make sure that the results were solid. Nice. All right, Jam920 asks, this is kind of out of left field. Actually, be a question I was going to ask myself, but is is there ever going to be any consideration for doing any digital ports of your products? By digital ports, I think they mean like computer versions, and yes. I would say no. We're, we're strictly committed to, we're a board game company. Um, I could see maybe doing an app, possibly, uh, that might support the game. Or a helper, yeah, a helper or something. May, well, there are already helpers out there. People have already made. Uh, Reggie Bowers has done a number of really fantastic helpers for the games. Mm-hmm. They're free, uh, so many many thanks to Reggie for all his hard work. Uh, now I'm thinking more in terms of um, oh, like like the kind of the kind of apps that Steve uses to to keep the score of a game or keep time for a game. Um, I think maybe, we'll, uh, maybe call plays, maybe 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 an automatic automated play caller for you know for the for when you're playing solo for the opponent you know you press a button and it calls the play for you mm-hmm. yeah something like that I could maybe see but what you about know, app board? development is not inexpensive what about and a I don't board? Have, I don't have the expertise to do it myself so what like a board reader a board reader something uh, that would if it would give you because you know to give you the result. Yeah, there. You know, people have, people have done that. They've they've taken the game. They basically copied the charts into an Excel sheet, and then they've got it so they can push a button and it gives you the result. Uh, again, that defeats. I feel like that defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do. I, I, I you know, I I am not a computer gamer. I'm not a video gamer. I, I do not get joy out of playing a game on a computer. Uh, I enjoy the tactile experience of cards and dice and you know, I, I think that I think our lives are are filled with enough digital entertainment as it is. I don't feel like a need to add to that digital entertainment. Plus, if you do, then you're competing with that digital entertainment. I mean, you know, you're gonna you're gonna have a little a little spreadsheet that that gives you a, a, a textual result of a football play, or you can play Call of Duty. You know, it's like it's hard to compete in that arena anyway. Right. But it's not really an arena I want to compete in. Okay. Uh, Steeler fan asks, I'd like to know what Keith's favorite play game is and what his favorite game that is made by someone else. Well, my favorite play game, that's, I get to ask that question a lot. And um, I always go back to second season because it was my first game and I spent you know many, 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 many years developing it. That's not to say I don't like the other games because I, I do. I, I get a big kick out of playing uh, the full play hoops game is super fun. Um, but you know, if I had to name one, I probably would name second season because it's, it's, it does everything I want in a football game and tells a story, uh, in a, in a compelling way. As far as other games, other by other makers, I would have to go with Pokemon. Probably that is a great, that's, that's the game I wish I would have invented. That is an amazing game. Pokemon trading card game, an amazing game. That's fantastic. Mitch asks, I'd like to know what the next Express game will be, and can you see an Express version of Red, White, and Blue Racing? We've, you know, I don't know that there are going to be any more Express games, uh, mainly because, you know, I don't think Red, White, and Blue Racing is really 
uh, you know, is really amenable to an express version. I've thought about it. Like, how can I do express golf? You know, well, there's really not a way to do that that would make it, you know, where you'd really be able to capture, uh, you know, capture the essence. I, 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 and maybe at some point it'll come to me. But right now I'm thinking, okay, golf, nah, I can't see express golf. NASCAR, certainly not. I don't know how you do NASCAR. I mean, you'd still have to set up all the cars. And, you know, I, I don't see that as an express candidate. So what do you have? For, uh, you have what? Uh, hockey Express, right? And Hockey, soccer, football, both Canadian and American football, baseball, uh, and lacrosse. We have lacrosse express as well, which we released at the holiday sale. Um so bowling express, man, yeah, bowling is kind of already an express game. I mean, it's got the, the bowling game has a express component included in it, where you can quick play a game and just kind of get a score based on what you roll. Um, so, I mean, that's out. Um, wrestling express, nah. how how would you do that? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't, I can't see that. Okay, uh, I'm trying to think of the other games that we have. Um, I guess I could just look at the shelf. What's on the shelf? Uh, Basketball Express. Uh, we already have that. That was the, high, the Highlight Maker Hoops is essentially mm-hmm. Express Highlight Maker Hoops Primetime Express. You can play a full, a full basketball game in 15 minutes. So hmm. we started we, with basketball. We started with the Express, you know, and, and then went to full play. So Okay. Uh, let's see, Joe Cards asks, wondering if they would ever consider having a play games event of some kind on the East Coast. And we were we've done many. We've done we've we've had a couple events in Hartford. Uh, we've had uh, we've done events in Boston at, at battle battleground games there in Medfield or in, in uh, Steve's uh, uh, neck of the woods. We uh, did an event in Charlotte. Uh, so yeah, we we have done. You know, we, we're certainly not adverse to doing events on the East Coast. Um, and, and we may do one this fall. It's possible. Yeah, and that's something we've been talking about throughout the show, too, is, is trying to get some kind of something going here on the East Coast, whether it's, you know, play or through us or through somebody else. But, yeah, the uh, I, I think that's that's going to happen at some point. You know, in some way or form, we're going to have something together on the East Coast. I, I don't doubt what, that. What really makes it work is if somebody local has a connection uh, with a local game store that has a good gaming space. Like Steve in, in Battleground Games, he knows the guy who goes in there and plays. He, he was able to ask him, look, could we, uh, could we meet here some Saturday, you know, about 15, 20 guys and, and play games? Sure, no problem. Uh, sometimes we, we, you know, we pay a table fee. Sometimes we don't. Uh I mean, that, that we did this in, in Wisconsin with uh, Travis Jansen set up the thing in Wisconsin where basically his local game store, we came in, I, I flew in for it. Uh, so it's not, it's not that hard. If it, it's, I, I should say it's particularly easier. It's noticeably easier if, you, if somebody's got a connection with the mm-hmm. local game store and can get the venue. Everything else falls into place after that. If yeah. you've got the space to play. I, I'd love to see something like get a hotel for a Friday and a Saturday night that it's got a, a, some kind of a space to play and, and just kind of have it open, have an open gaming area there if they would allow that. And I think that's something that we might be looking into over here. And, and you know, so so people could come in and spend the night, you know, and not have to drive around as much, you know. Right. We did that in Hartford two years ago. And uh, it was at a, it was a Hampton Inn right by the airport. So it was great because we didn't have to rent a car. to just take a shuttle. The shuttle picked us up at the airport like a mile and a half from the airport we went back to the, to the hotel and we had we had the event in the atrium area it's a little dicey though because uh that common area is for all the hotel guests to use and you know you can't really bring in 50 people for that we had about i think we had about a dozen maybe 15 so it worked out good because you know, after they serve breakfast in that area then that space is pretty empty for for the rest of the day so otherwise you've got to rent the conference space and that you know that can be you know, three, four hundred dollars for the day, uh, which is not a deal breaker necessarily. I mean, we did that at the Cooperstown thing. We were in Cooperstown last year for the for the uh, Hall of Fame thing, mm-hmm. and we did an event at the hotel uh, before and after, and uh, we we uh, rented the conference room. So if you do it at a hotel, you've usually got to either hope that their common area is big enough to accommodate whatever size crowd you're going to have, or you've got to rent the conference room. And and uh, you know absorb that expense, but either is doable. Okay, that's why I suggest a game store because the game store will usually let you come there for free. Mm-hmm. 
Is your products actually available in any game stores? We sell no. There, well, a few, but okay. generally speaking, we we just we sell only online. All right. Uh, S. J. Walker asks, wondering if any play now new games are on the horizon. Example: rugby fifteens or sevens, Olympic sport, or Gaelic sports like hurling. I know these are very niche, but then again, so are roller derby and dodgeball, and I'm told these play games are super fun. Uh, we do have big plans for play now. Uh, we've not been able to get to them because of the expansion of the play classic titles. You know, we've been we've been pretty busy. Uh, remind me not to schedule a basketball game release, a convention, and a soccer express game release all within the same 30 day period. That was, what was I thinking? That was just, that was just killed us in terms of workflow. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're so far behind on stuff. That was, I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, so we, do, we do have a number of, of, of play now titles in the pipeline. Uh, and we also have our we, 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 play now is kind of branching off into separate, uh, in, into a separate entity called studio spicy which is also under the, the play games umbrella, which does a different kind of a, a approach and see is kind of driving the bus on that. Uh, so yes, we do have a number of, of uh, play now titles that are in various stages of production. Some of them are pretty close. We, we will be releasing some of them a, as soon as possible. It's just a matter of, you know, carving out the time as far as Gaelic sports. Uh, I, I, I'm not so, I'm not sure about sports titles, for uh, uh, play now, although I w- certainly would not rule it out. One of the sports titles we're, we're, we're thinking about was this uh, this uh, Tackleby, this game called Tackleby, which is, is it's a fictional game, not even a real game, but it's it's the it's a really good tabletop sports game. It has a lot of cool decision making, and it's it's interesting to visualize. Uh, so yeah, we could. I mean, if we if we can do Tackleby, then we could certainly do. You know, some Gaelic sports or or what, what about like sports? track and field or swimming? Something that would be, I mean, yes, there are dry statistics and times and all that, but there are storytelling aspects to those things, especially when you get into the longer distance races where someone might want not want to do sixteen laps of four hundred meters. At, at yeah, I think you know part of the, the part of the deal is um, track and field is is problematic because you have so many different events. Right, you basically have to have you basically have to develop five, six, seven different games to go right. in that one game. And then that, that presents its own unique set of challenges. Uh, second of all, you know, the, the appeal, you know, is, I want to say it's questionable. And mm-hmm. I say questionable in a nice way because it's like, you know, who knows how many people would want to, would want to, you know, right. Buy a but game like that. People will talk about it the next three weeks because it's the Olympics, but then after that, it's we'll talk about it in four years when it's in Los Angeles. Right, and when you're developing and you're spending time playtesting and developing a game, uh, the la- you know you, you want to feel like there's a, a reasonable uh, uh, you know reasonable acceptance of a reasonable uh, market for it. And track and field. I just don't know. I just don't yeah. know that that's got the, got legs. Yeah. Um, in Quite fact, you know, I, I wonder you know, a lot of the sports, uh, you know, that, that that get pitched to us, uh, like Australian rules football or or uh, <clears throat> uh, curling or or pickleball or you know things like that. Um, you know, I, I always I always feel like in my head I feel like, well, geez, if if Canadian football can't make it or lacrosse, you know, we we yeah. that lacrosse game is a great game. It's one of, my, one of my favorite games, but you know, people just, they just w- didn't support it. They, I don't want to say they didn't support it. They just weren't interested in it. There weren't enough people interested in it to, you know, keep it viable. Same thing with Canadian football is are, there just aren't enough people interested yeah. enough to really, you know, make it to, to continue to develop new seasons and, yeah. and new vintage mm-hmm. seasons uh, and new we play have, mat and stuff like that. We hear that from other developers too. That it's like you know, boy, I particularly like this sport, but am I going to spend you know a year developing a game and sell ten copies because ten people are really into this, like me, you know? And so yeah, you you do have to weigh that out between you know realistically, you know, is this going to you know produce yeah, enough I mean, to make you it worthwhile? Also look at things like lacrosse or. For Canadian football, when they're on, you know, ESPN Ocho, 
or yeah, you know, so it tells you something. It, you know, I mean, if if you if they're not something that you come across even in a casual manner, then what's the chance of selling something like that if if people don't really hear it? I mean, the days of ESPN actually having sports on during a weekday are gone. I mean, there's Australian rules football is something I remember from forty years ago, but. I'm not paying two hundred dollars a year to to watch a stream at four in the morning, you know right. that, that, that type of deal. Well, I I, I, do, I don't want to let this discussion you know move to a different topic without saying how great a sport lacrosse is. Look, indoor box right. lacrosse is an amazing sport. We got a, we got a team here in Denver, uh, the Mammoth, and they routinely will fill the Pepsi Center. Well, it used to be the Pepsi Center, Ball Arena now. Hmm. Uh, you know they will routinely fill it uh, because Denver, for whatever reason is a lacrosse town, but yet they can't get 3000 people in Atlanta to go to a game. Yeah. You know, they just, they, they can't seem to get a foothold. I, I don't know why it is. Cause well, well, to be fair for years when they, even when they were going to the world series, they couldn't get 10,000 people to watch the Braves. <laughs> they so couldn't get 3000 people to watch the Atlanta flames. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. But lacrosse is a great sport, but it just doesn't, yeah. I, don't, I don't know why it doesn't uh, catch on. Or right. doesn't call on. Got a couple quicker questions for you, so we can uh, rip through these. Uh, Dave Lorino, any plans to release or re-release a USFL or WFL set for second season? We are doing the WFL set. We're going to play. So this is the 50th anniversary of the World Football League this summer. Uh, and we it, it, their opening weekend actually coincides with the weekend that we're at the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton. Uh, oh, wow. August 23rd and 24th. It actually coincides with that same week. So we're going to – we're going to. I don't know whether we're going to – we're either going to replay the first week of the WFL season, uh, or we're going to if if people would rather play different teams, then we'll just play you know select matchups. Depend. I, I'm not sure how many people are going to be there for that. Um, it's a, it's a mix of different game companies, so we'll have a bunch of people there, and they may want to play Apple football instead of second season. But so we're playing a World Football League commemorative. If we're going to remember the World Football League uh, at the uh, Canton event, and we're going to do so with with a, a reconfigured set. The, the set I originally made that set in two thousand one, and it was in I made it in Microsoft Word in a team sheet format. It's super ugly. I mean, it just looks like a piece of. <laughs> it's very you know very uh, very dated, plain. very dated. Yeah. Yes, and it, and it also doesn't have any of the bells and whistles that people have, you know like from the second season sets, like the finder columns and and uh, you know the colors and stuff like that. So I'm I'm working on reconfiguring those uh, team sheets into team cards with the team colors and, and, and the full names and, and, uh, and all the, all the bells and whistles. And we'll have that ready to debut at the hall of fame. And then after the hall of fame uh, event, we'll make it available to everybody else. Right. And sure. it, should, it should be pretty cool. Was that the league that the police showed up at the championship game and were raided right in the locker room? The jerseys. Yes. Birmingham. They won and found their jerseys gone. <laughs> Actually, yeah, watched, I think you watched that I, video a couple days ago. I think you got to be an old guy to remember the World Football League. It's kind of dis, it's kind of disenchanting to me that, m- that more people don't remember the World Football League like I do. I was super excited when the World Football League started up because it was the summer of 1974. I just graduated high school. I was going off into the army. I had some time in between. The NFL was on strike. The players were on strike. So the World Football League was the only football available, and it was a new league with new helmets, new uniforms. I was super stoked. But I'm, I'm learning that uh, most people weren't as stoked about it as I was. But anyway. there was there was no money. Yeah, there was. Yeah, no money. it was badly underfunded. Badly underfunded. I'm gonna skip a couple of these because we talked about Olympics and such. Um, Matt asks, how many hours a week do you devote to this? It's a full time job. This is my full time job. So uh, yes, it's it's probably more hours than I should. It's probably about 50 hours a week. Okay. Uh, Josh asks, I would love to know if there's any possibility of restarting the fictional hockey league, Hockey North America. Uh, Again, that is, you know, we've talked about that. Um, I I don't have an answer for that. We have considered from both sides. Um, Again, the reason we discontinued it was because there didn't seem to be the interest in it that there was in the other uh, fictional sports leagues. Um, it's, it's interesting. You know, our, our fictional uh, leagues, have re- particularly Scram, the, the NASCAR, the NASCAR uh, alternative, and Baseball America uh, and Football America, those have, have uh, you know, 
become really, really well received. People does really, Tower get does Tower get royalty checks for that? <laughs> uh, he should. He's he's he's, uh, he's he uh, he is. Uh, well, we named we named him Boston Minuteman because uh, as his payment. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. So yes, uh, you know, generally speaking, the, the fictional teams do really, really leads do they do better every year than they did the year before. Uh, okay. More and more people, I think. Uh, and, and it's funny because, you know, originally I always thought fictional was, was super neat, uh, but people are cool to it. Like in, in the early days of play, you know, people were cool to fictional teams. Like, hey, why would I play fictional? But there's a, a certain liberation you get from playing, you know, especially if it's an established franchise that has a history, you know, that you've been playing this team. You, you, you know, you've, you've watched Wayne Montana race, you know, for, for like 10 years now. So you begin to get familiar with them. And it, it almost becomes, you know, it, it becomes very real, you know, almost as real as the real thing. Uh, so our fictional leagues do w- really well. The, the the hockey league wasn't doing as well, uh, but that was before we introduced Hockey Blast Express, uh, and that that may I think that really is where the uh, the fresh enthusiasm for hockey North America uh, comes from. People are, are enjoying the Express Hockey game, and they'd like to do a fictional project with it. So. Okay. Uh, I, I, I don't. I, I, I can't say that we're going to re, to bring it back, but we have considered it. Okay, uh, and and it, for, it likely will come back in some form. Okay, we um, we have two people asking this next question: Jim McGregor and also Pops Review. They're asking about um, an MMA game. I don't think we'll. You know, we've been asked to do an MMA game. I don't think we'll ever do an MMA game. Um, Probably for the same reason we won't probably do a boxing game. Um, it's just not, you know, it's just it's not something that I have a, a taste for. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you, you know, in order to in order to develop a game, you really kind of have to immerse yourself in that sport, as like if you're doing a sports game. So, so because you want you want the the feel of the sport to translate into the board game. You want you want to feel like when you're playing that game, you want to feel like you're watching it unfold uh, before you. And for me, that would require me to watch a lot of MMA, and not, uh, not your cup of tea. It's not really my cup of tea. No, nor, nor do I have the uh, the cable package, which would allow me to watch it either. So, have you de- developed a sports game of, uh, that you're not necessarily a fan of the sport of? No, uh, I think all the games that I've developed, I've either I've I've some uh, some of them I've I've approached less uh, enthusiastically. It's like I don't know, but when I've gotten into it, it's like oh, this is pretty interesting. Okay. Um, so no, like golf, golf was like that. I, I, I put off for many years doing a golf game cause I thought, uh, I don't think there's that many golf fans. I don't think people, people are really going to like it. And then people started, uh, suggesting that, that we do a golf game. And I, I was thinking that, um, I was thinking that the golf game engine would be based on the bowling game where you'd okay. roll a D 20 and you try to aim would be some manual dexterity to it. And, there was a guy named a guy Bob Bicker is his name suggested that we do history maker golf do do use the baseball game engine for a golf game and I went through all these you know all these reasons why that what that wouldn't work you know that we, we don't want to do that uh, but then when I tried it I thought oh actually this might work and I began looking into golf and I thought oh this is pretty exciting and so I, I it, you know something that I really had very little interest in all of a sudden I became very interested in it and. And the golf game, you know, came out of it. So I would say uh, that is an example of, of a sport that I was And tennis is the same way. Right. Uh, not particularly interested in tennis, but once I started looking into it, so, and really soccer was the same way. So when I I was of the I was of the uh, the mindset that soccer, how are you? It's, there's one goal score in the game, a one nothing game. How are you going to get excited about that? There's there's nothing exciting about a one nothing game until you watch it. Until you right exactly, so you watch it, then, then, it. Then, then you get it, yeah. Right. So uh, I would say all the sports games that we put out, I, I have you know b- become a fan of the sport, or I was already a fan of the sport. Uh, awesome. MMA, I'm not so sure. I want to, you know, invest invest in that. Invest in I've, being I've seen in the chat any chance of expanding red, white, and blue to other forms of auto racing, such as Formula One or IndyCar or... That would fall under the category of, of, of golf. Right now, it doesn't interest me at all. Okay. Right now, I, I like I like NASCAR, you know, for more than enough racing for me. 
uh, I love the I love the noise, the the wrecks, the color. I especially love the color, you mm-hmm. know, the different color schemes and and just the the over the top, you know, loudness and speed. Uh, so for me, that's enough racing thrills. Uh, but I, I wouldn't rule out someday, you know, watching a, a Formula One race and thinking, oh, this is actually pretty cool. Uh, and so I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, but I, it's not on my list of things I, you know, I must do right now. Um, all right. Where am I here? Uh Don asks, will play release older baseball seasons than 35 for History Maker Baseball? Oh, 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 oh yeah, our earliest season right now is 1935. We actually did have a 1923 season, uh, but then we then we started recalculating the fielding ratings, you know, so we removed, removed that. It was The fielding ratings for that season were cal- calculated the old way. Uh, so rather than recalculate, then we just removed the season. It wasn't wasn't particularly popular. You know, th- there are people that like that era, um, uh, but again, it, it's it's it doesn't seem to be big enough to really be sustainable. Uh, like uh, so, if I could spend I could spend the same amount of time working on say the nineteen sixty five baseball season as I would on the nineteen nineteen baseball season. And you know the newer season's gonna is gonna sell as mm-hmm. reach more people. You know more people will be excited about a modern like a like a like a you know an eighties season or a seventies yeah. season or a nineties season. Yeah. I, I think even the two thousands is starting to get vintage. You know, okay, yeah. two thousand was twenty five years ago. So the you know that's not to say we won't ever do uh, a de- a dead ball season. We, we may someday. Uh, I don't have any in plans at the moment. All right. Yeah, that seems to be some of the overall themes we're seeing here for some of the questions. This is another one from S.T. Patrick from uh, Sp- the hey, Sports, hey, how are you? Sports Simulation Magazine here. And it says, will play ever eventually uh, turn to PDF option to backfill more classic seasons for each sport? So I guess the overall question is, are you guys going to continue to backfill some of these seasons for, for your games? And uh, will that be print, PDF, a combination of the two? So I, I guess that's kind of a general overarching question that we have here uh we do have plans to continue to offer vintage seasons and uh you know as as you said at the top of the show you know we sometimes do them print only we sometimes do them pdf and print uh you know at holiday sale we sometimes do them pdf only so a lot of it depends on each each season is different we take each season individually and we have a you know, we have we have metrics that we that we consider, uh, and so there's not one answer to that question, I, I, except to say yes. You know, we we do have plans for future vintage seasons. Some of them will undoubtedly be available as PDFs. Mm-hmm. Others will not be. Some will be available only as PDFs. Okay. Todd asks about, you know, what's Sam's role in the company? Uh, maybe the specific question. Uh, you've, exp- you've branched out so effectively the last few years after your son came on full-time. Explain his role and influence and in, in what, with what you're doing. It must be so cool to have your kid work with you. I'm so blessed to have Sam work with me. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's a real privilege and a joy to be able to work with your son, you know, to, to uh, do the family business. There you go. Although he has a very different vision than I do because he's, you know, and, and, and rightfully so, mm-hmm. uh, I, I do not begrudge him that. It would be very, we had many, many, many discussions lately, you know, within the past year, two years, particularly the past year. Uh, and, you know, it would be very easy, I think, for me to say, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way we're going to continue to do it. Look, it's working. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I don't feel that way, though. I do not feel that way. I feel like things change. And I'm all your always <laughs> and we need to be we need to be thinking about 2027 right now. We don't want to be thinking about you know what worked in in, in 2000, what worked in 1980. Right. You know, we, we're thinking we're always thinking about what's the future looking like. Where, where are we? What's working now? What will work in the future? Um, so Sam's role, you know, Sam has a, a, a very wide ranging role in the company. In fact, the really. Uh, the company is all really more his than mine these days. The web assets you see, the graphic design, um, you know, the new game ideas, the the video presence that we have, the video streams, all that is Sam. Sam is, Sam does all that. 
uh, you know, he creates the graphics, he creates the, 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 the technology stuff, you know, uh, so he has a, has a huge role in the company and, 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 and it will be growing larger and, and the company will be changing uh, as he, you know, as he takes over more, it will be going more in the direction of his interests. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, that's a perfectly natural thing. It's sure. a perfectly right thing. And, and I'm a hundred percent behind it. Okay. Uh, question from Randy Gonzalez here. Uh, you ever consider making the cards bigger for some sets? He said he'd gladly pay more. I mean, all of us are getting old with poor eyesight. Any any thoughts about making some some bigger cards? Well, Randy should know. He bought the XL baseball cards. We did, we did offer the 2023. We're always listening to that. So we always take that into consideration. So, like, for example, we made the, the 2023 baseball season. We offered it in the standard size, the black and white. And we also offered it a trading card size version, uh, which was the, the, the size of standard Baseball trading cards, uh, three and a half by two and a half, full color, you know. So, you know, we do do that. But, again, it's 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 more complex than just, oh, yeah, let's make all our cards bigger. Because sometimes it, it doesn't make economic sense. Sometimes right. it makes more sense. I mean, sometimes, a lot of times, the size of the card is driven by the economics. Uh, and uh, and also, also the, the game mechanics. Um, obviously... Um, you couldn't do golf course cards on 32 up, you know, on, on hockey card, hockey size cards, you know, uh, on, on the other hand, you know, there's not that much data on a hockey card aside from six qualities and, and three or four stars and a name, you know? Uh, so you don't need a lot of space. Um, I think, I think, you know, font size is important. Um, all that to say that we, we do consider making larger cards and as they are successful, we will do more. Uh, and but there are there are also some cards that we can't make larger, or or uh, you know it, it doesn't always make sense. I guess we can always make all cards larger, but um, sometimes it doesn't make sense to do so. Like the hockey cards, we can't make bigger hockey cards because then we'd have what about the play mats? What about the game? We have to re, we have to you know redesign the game itself, and that may come someday. You know where we where we redesign the game so as to accommodate bigger cards. Right. Um, but for now, that's not something we're doing. Yeah. Now, D. Scott Howard here is saying that you're a hologram, that Sam designed this AI version of Keith <laughs> that we're seeing now. <laughs> yes, this is not really Keith. Sam made this. It, it, it fooled you, though, didn't it? He's, he's been, yeah. You've been voice tracking on stations for years now, too, right? Yes, right, right. Yeah. exactly, right. So... So those are the questions that we got from our Discord and your Facebook group and our Facebook group. So, Well, it looks like we're two hours in, so that yeah. was a, a good session. Yeah, we're going to be wrapping up. One final question here. What do you think the future of this hobby is? I think that there is a future of this hobby and that we are going to be part of it. Uh, I do feel, though, that it may not look the same nor, nor should it. And it's t- t- completely reasonable to think that the, the hobby may not look the same in 20 years that than it does right now. I think um, I, I want to be I want to be careful with what I say because I don't want people to be put off or, or upset. Uh, I just think you know things change, and uh, we are committed to. Like I, like our like our mission statement has always said for the past twenty five years, we are committed to pre- preserving and advancing the grand pastime of tabletop sports. Now, if advancing means some doing something different in order to keep people interested in coming to the party, then by golly, we're going to do that because that's what we that's what we do. Uh, we are interested in preserving it as well, um, but we're not interested in preserving it at the exclusion of advancing it. So we, mm-hmm. we, we are going to do our best to keep this hobby, you know, vibrant. Um, and that's what we spend our days doing, <laughs> thinking about and planning yeah. for. It's one thing Ron always talks about, you know, since we started the show five years ago, is that uh, he, he feels we're in the golden age of this hobby right now with, with all There's the choices so that we have. Out there. Yeah. Yeah, I would say uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. 
And you're part of that. I mean, what you've done is certainly part of that. But when you say the golden age, it almost it sort of suggests that the age to come is not going to be as golden. And I'm no, not sure I believe that. Okay. Uh, you know, and, and the reason why that we, we get asked that and we ask that is, you know, it's a lot of older people playing these games, ordering the cards and, you know, playing the strats and the appers and all this stuff here. And, and you wonder if there's a younger crowd coming in to fill those holes and what that younger crowd is going to be expecting. Would they be okay rolling dice and playing strat and apper and play games? Are they going to, you know, are they going to want to use this? Is that what the future is, you know, for the, for this hobby? I do not think that is the future of the hobby. And if you go to Dice Tower or Gen Con or uh, Origins, you'll see tens of thousands of people, young people, playing board games, just like what we play. They're not necessarily sports games, but they are board games. Uh, and so to say that you know the younger generation, all they want to do is, is play with their phones or play on, on an on a, uh, Xbox, that's not true. I think that as, as life... Uh, is more driven toward the computer. Think about how much time the average person spends on a computer now at work these days. And when they get home, do they want to go back to the computer or, or do, they want, do they want to spend more screen time? No, I think that's that's behind the resurgence of, of the board game hobby. Uh, so I, I would say that young people most certainly are interested in playing board games. The trick is to get them to play sports board games. And we don't feel like that is... Uh, a, a task that can't be met. And we're going to do what we can to make it happen. And it will, it will require some, I think, you know, out of the box thinking and some, some risk, but uh, that's what we are. That's what we're looking at to. Fantastic. That's a good answer. I think awesome. that's a great answer. I would say the golden age of sports board gaming is yet to come. Ooh, okay. I like that. I like that. All right. Well, we're going to wrap this one up here. You've been listening to the Digital Dice podcast, episode 233. We were joined by Keith Avalone of Play Games as we kick off year six of the podcast. We want to thank everybody that tuned in over the last few years. Or if you're a new listener, thanks for tuning in here as well. Ways to get a hold of us, digitaltodice.com is the website. 978-751-DICE is the text line. Digital to dice at yahoo.com is the email. And over on Facebook, facebook.com slash groups slash digital to dice. We want to thank everybody that uh, sent in questions for Keith, whether it was on Facebook or Discord or whatever it is. Uh, hopefully we got your question answered in the whole bit. And um, yeah, I guess, Keith, I guess uh, I will be looking forward to seeing you in person next year at PlayCon. I can't wait. It, it, fun. It, we, I wish we had the detail set. We we don't have the the plans made as of yet, but as soon as we do, we'll uh, reach yeah. out to you. If, if not sooner, you you never know where we might connect somewhere at these conventions uh, here. That's right. That's right. We I might, was we might see this fall in the East Coast. I was hoping to get to the Cooperstown one. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. It's it's still a maybe, but it's probably mostly a not. But you know, and it might be a, a last minute thing, if depending on yeah, what goes on. You talking about Canton or Canton? Canton. You're talking Canton. Oh, Canton. Yeah, the football oh, one. Wow. Yeah, the football one. Yeah, I was hoping to sneak out there, but it, it's kind of not looking that way now. But you yeah. never know. Uh, we're going to continue talks. We're trying to set something here on the East Coast, some kind of small gaming convention. You never know where that could go from here. But I think the conventions are, are a good way of keeping everybody connected, and uh, I I think you know um, you know. Something out here on the East Coast, dedicated on the East Coast, might be a, might be a good idea of some sort. And that's something Absolutely. we're going to look at. So, and again, if you were in the chat room, thank you so much. Um, we had a lot of people stopping by, just kind of throwing out some feedback here at the end. So we want to recognize them. And as Adirondack Gus, who sent us some questions, Barbara, thanks for coming by. Uh, Mr. Steve Tower, thanks for coming by, Doug. And Charles and Higher Ground Gaming, he's an East Coast guy. He wants to do something on the East Coast. Yes, I think Eric, we're gonna we're gonna look into that. So again, Keith, thank you so much for helping us thank kick you. off super year, fun. year six of this. It really it really was fun. And thanks for answering all the questions. And uh, we had a great time. So did I. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. All right. Really appreciate all you guys do for the hobby as well. No, thank, thank, you. thank you so much. All right, stay tuned, Keith. We're gonna sign off, but stay tuned, and we'll we'll have some parting words with Keith. Again, thank you so much, guys, and we'll talk to you later. Bye bye. Bye bye.